Dobro jutro svim učesnicima. Good morning to all participants. I hope you can hear me well and that everything is working well. It's nine o'clock. Uh, let's not prolong the start. We have already 70 participants and uh, certainly we will have some more joining us later on. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to open the second one out of uh, seven webinars which will take place within the develop the process of development of uh, environmental strategy isap uh, organized by say and uh, the consortium enova Zener, sponsored by the Swedish Embassy. As you may know, we are already in the process and uh, developing strategy. Among others, the strategy includes uh, the waste management. It is a great challenge for all of us. You may know that we have in seven groups, uh, seven working groups, uh, which are working uh, to develop this strategy using participatory approach and uh, involve uh, engagement of multiple stakeholders. This is a novelty in strategic planning processes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The challenge is even higher because uh, this is the first time that Bosnia and Herzegovina will have a strategy which will bring us closer to EU membership. To this end, we also organized this uh, webinar, which uh, aims at presenting the experience of Estonia in approximation process and in the waste management and development of relevant strategies uh, rele relevant for their path. We will, my, my, I will moderate this uh, gathering together with my Draženko. Uh, I'm Irem Silajic. Uh, we are the leading expert uh, for the waste management in this process. Uh, I'm honored to present uh, Mr. Harry Muder, Mur and uh, Peter Eka, who will be presenters at today's workshop. And before I introduce them and give them the floor, I will kindly ask my colleague Draženko to provide a brief overview of the situation in the waste sector and the challenges in this sector, which were identified by the working group. And we identified these challenges uh, within the working group uh, in two sessions we already had. Dajenko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Irem. Let me first uh, welcome our presenters and all other participants at today's uh, webinar. As I can see, we have uh, m many participants who are not members of our working groups, uh, uh, which is very good. Uh, and before I start, uh, let me note that the working group uh, for waste had two workshops. And for our presenters and other participants, uh, I will describe briefly the current situation in the waste management sector in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In 2019, based on the statistics uh, we have available, 1.2 million tons of waste was generated in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 77% of this waste was collected and the major part of uh, the collected waste uh, originates from households, 18% from uh, indust industry and 4% uh, uh, from public uh, services. The organic fraction is predominant up to 90% depending from one municipality to the other and the packaging uh, waste uh, accounts for 40%. I already mentioned 
of the population is covered by the waste collection services uh, and the dominant treatment of waste uh, continues to be disposal landfilling. We have seven sanitary landfills, uh, which were contrast constructed uh, within the project of the World Bank uh, Solid Waste Management in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we have several, uh, four uh, landfills um, at the municipal level, but they, they are not non-compliant. Uh, they do not uh, meet all the requirements to be sanitary uh, land landfills and 46 uh, municipal non-compliant uh, uh, landfills in the Federation, the Publica Subska and the Bačko district. We have a large number of illegal dump sites and uh, data from 2019 indicate uh, 2,900 and something uh, illegal Dump in BIH, we have five uh, sorting facilities. In uh, the uh, the facility in Dobo is non-operational, at and uh, that is where they are sorting uh, mainly the packaging waste. Uh, we have uh, no facilities for treatment of uh, animal waste, uh, medical waste, uh, and some other hazardous waste. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have operators in the Federation. We have operators for packaging and electronic waste. In the Publika Srpska, we have one operator for packaging waste. Regarding the funding of these services, mainly the utility companies uh, charge their fees from households and partly uh, they receive funds from local self-government units and the price uh, is based on the square meter of uh, housing area and uh, amounts uh, to approximately 10 uh, in the Federation, it's uh, eight, uh, 88 uh, km per ton, and uh, in the Publika Srpska, it's 113. No, in Brčko, it's 80 uh, km, but in the Federation, 102 km per ton. Regarding strategic documents uh, in place in the Publika Srpska, we have a strategy. A waste management strategy, which uh, is valid until 2026. And based on this strategy, they also developed a, a waste management plan until 2029 in Bačko district. They have strategy on waste management within the environmental strategy, which is valid until 2026. And the strategy, uh, waste management strategy in the Federation expired it am already informed you uh, of the principle on which we re rely in the development uh, of the ESAP. Uh, we are the second working group, the waste management group. We have uh, working groups uh, for all the levels of the government, for levels, for jurisdictions, Federation, but for District, Republika Srpska and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So far, we have had uh, two meetings of the working groups and the working groups uh, defined uh, key challenges uh, for all the levels of the government. And I will briefly address these uh, key challenges. The working group uh, for BIH uh, identified the lack of an efficient mechanism of planning, coordination, monitoring of activities in the waste management sector. And the second challenge is, is insufficiently efficient uh, system of the implementation of international obligation in the waste management sector, Basel Convention. Convention. Uh, regarding challenges for the Federation and Republika Srpska, they are rather similar. We have 11 of them defined uh, uh, challenges in the Federation, insufficiently developed legal framework, uh, lack of policies, uh, insufficiently efficient uh, work of the institutions, uh, lack of policies uh, for circular economy, uh, 
the system of uh, generation monitoring uh, and reporting is not in place, lack of funds for uh, adequate uh, waste management, uh, insufficient structure, insufficiently developed infrastructure for collection and disposal, uh, insufficiently developed uh, awareness, public awareness, uh, in the insufficiently developed a system for uh, 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 extended uh, producers' responsibility, uh, the uh, the issue of uh, treatment of special categories uh, is not uh, resolved. Uh, in the public service, we have similar challenges. Uh, the only difference is the non-implementation of measures for prevention of waste that the, the measures have been defined but they are not implemented and insufficiently developed system for management of hazardous waste and uh, unresolved uh, issues of uh, black points so-called black points Bechko district uh, the working group uh, also defined seven key challenges and uh, perhaps i should uh, mention the lack of the system of expanded producers responsibility extended the producers responsibility and uh, the uh, non-compliant local landfill very soon they uh, will uh, uh, th there will be arrangements for them to transport their waste uh, to another uh, compliant landfill in Zvornik. That would be all from me at this point. I wish you successful work and uh, I invite all participants of today's webinar who are not members of the working groups to feel free to register for participation in any of the working groups. Uh, you can use the email addresses uh, which you see on the screen. That would be all from me now. Thank you, Draženko, and thank you very much for sticking to the time line. Uh, we will try to do so. Also, now uh, may I invite Mr. Hari Mura to make his first presentation and discuss the challenges and needs uh, for approximation with EU and uh, to share with us his experience uh, from Estonia. He's director of the uh, environmental program in Tallinn within the SEI. He is he has PhD uh, obtained uh, at the technological faculty in Tallinn uh, uh, in the uh, and he also has a PhD in from the university in Lund. Uh, his uh, main focus is circular economy and environmental protection in the light of EU policies. He has more than 20 years of experience, uh, both uh, at the national and international level on sustainable waste management and sustainable production and uh, consumption. Uh, you will later on also have an opportunity to meet Mr. Hadi, who also was involved uh, in the approximation processes in Estonia. And to this and his experience and knowledge, uh, he will seek to share with us are very relevant for us in terms of uh, opening uh, new perspectives and uh, uh, providing new op uh, opportunities for Bosnia and Herzegovina for strategic planning. As I said at the beginning, this process is crucial for us uh, at this point, especially when EU is uh, imposing new requirements for Bosnia and Herzegovina. We are looking forward to hear their presentations. Mr. Hari, you have the floor. Good morning also from my side. Um, it's really a pleasure to share uh, some of the experiences uh, from Estonian point of view. I think there are quite many interesting issues and lessons learned when it comes to the waste management uh, policy, European Union waste management policy implementation, because Estonia and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have quite many similarities. So basically, if we 
if you look back on our history or let's say the political history, then this is also very similar. There are many other features which actually make our countries quite similar. And uh, when I was uh, hearing uh, Drazenko's uh, presentation about the challenges and issues which are up there in your country and different regions, then I also recognize that there are quite many similarities. And I think it would be maybe interesting to share some of our experience, experiences when it comes to the approximation and the implementation of EU waste legislation. Um, uh, before I jump into the waste management, and um, I will maybe still share some of the facts um, related to Estonia. Um, I hope that you see my slides also in parallel. Uh, not yet, uh, I don't see them, but... Uh... Now, now the screen uh, sharing has started, so you can start. Good. So I, I tried to do in parallel uh, pre presentation in English, but I hope that you can follow it in, in, uh, in your own uh, language uh, in a way. But we will have uh, some time at the end of the uh, uh, workshop so that uh, you have definitely a chance to ask clarification questions. Unfortunately, the time which is uh, today uh, given for us for this short uh, overview is, is very short and uh, me and Peter, uh, we really like to talk. So I hope that we don't run into the uh, problem related to the time. So please, Irem, keep an eye so that we don't um, get stuck into certain issues. Yeah. But again, when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to Estonia, as I already said, there are many, many similarities. And uh, Estonia is definitely one of the uh, smallest uh, European Union member states, uh, especially when it comes to the population. But as I already said, uh, there are certain similarities, especially early times. Uh, although being a small country, uh, we uh, used to have many uh, municipalities, so the country was split into small municipalities, and this is definitely an issue which I would say also could uh, cause certain, uh, let's say, challenges or even problems when it comes to the development of, uh, of uh, waste management system. And uh, in this small country, we used to have uh, more than 200 small municipalities. Today, we have split it into almost half, or let's say there are approximately 80 municipalities, but still we clearly see a lack of cooperation and, uh, and uh, this is one of the challenges. And we will come to that uh, once again, and Peter will cover a little bit better this area. But um, when it comes to the um, uh, economic uh, structure, then uh, Estonia has shifted away from more industrial uh, uh, activities. So as you can see, uh, services are now sharing uh, or taking the biggest share of, of the economic uh, structure. And Estonia is quite well known uh, from its IT uh, developments, but still when it comes to industry, then uh, we have a specific industry. We have this industry is mainly related to uh, um, large scale uh, resource utilization. And this is also a specific problem which has caused um, many, many challenges, especially when it comes to the waste management. Estonia joined to European Union in 2004, and uh, we are today also part of the Eurozone. So next, please. Maybe just a few uh, facts about the waste uh, generation and uh, waste uh, management. And uh, if you look on those figures, you might think that Estonia is uh, really a giant of uh, waste, you know, basically uh, generating uh, more, than, more than 20 million uh, tons of waste, which is basically 17 uh, tons uh, per person, uh, it sounds really crazy. So I think the European average is something like uh, three uh, tons uh, of waste per person. Uh, and here we, I'm not talking about municipal waste, but total waste generation. So Estonia exceeds this figure many, many times. And it, you might think that uh, something is wrong with this country, but this is mainly because of, of our specific uh, industry which is related to oil shale and oil shale processing and uh, Peter will a little bit uh, give you an overview of, of, the, of the challenge related to this type of huge amounts of, of mineral waste which is generated in this industry sector and this is maybe also something which is good to know you, for you because when you uh, do the accession process uh, there's always an issue related to all uh, waste not only municipal waste. And then in Estonia, the municipal waste 
share is only below, it's approximately 3% of total waste generation. You might think, uh, you know, why we have to talk about municipal waste if there's uh, so many other waste streams which have to be ta taken uh, care of. But when it comes to European Union um, waste uh, policy and targets, then this is mainly based on uh, municipal waste. So the municipal waste is, is definitely an issue where there is also need to focus more. And uh, here we also can share some of the experiences because as you see uh, officially uh, the recycling rate of municipal waste is only something close to 30 percent and you some of you maybe you know that uh, european union member states they had to re uh, achieve uh, 50 percent of recycling of municipal waste by 2020 and here you can see estonia is definitely below of that and maybe some of you also know that uh, at the moment there are four official uh, ways to calculate the uh, the share of waste recycling. Uh, this is still valid until 2025. And Estonia, we utilize the possibility to change the calculation method. And official figures are now below 50, but this is just a temporary game with uh, with figures. So this is this will be over by 2025. But uh, yeah. The real uh, recycling rate is uh, somewhere around 30 percent. Uh, at the same time, uh, landfilling, uh, I would say this is one of the success uh, cases uh, and uh, this is definitely an issue which we would like to share with you, you know, how to really move away from uh, land landfilling uh, society to more recycling uh, uh, society or, or, or waste management system. So, uh, and the, 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 the issue here is, is uh, incineration. So thanks to the incineration, we very quickly, approximately 10 years ago, cut down our uh, municipal waste uh, uh, landfilling uh, rate. Okay, maybe this is uh, enough uh, about the background of Estonia, because we will come to that uh, anyway um, in uh, next uh, presentations. But... Um, Maybe it's also worth to look into the recent developments on European Union uh, level, because this is something which will uh, definitely will be will be something which influence uh, will be will influence both Estonian uh, uh, developments concerning waste management. But this is also something you you also maybe have to take into account because um, this train is going very fast, and in a way nowadays or today uh, European waste belly policy is, is, is uh, basically integrated into the much wider uh, scope of uh, circular economy. And if you take the next slide, uh, then uh, uh, as you might know, <coughs> uh, approximately one year ago, European Commission adopted the, uh, uh, the new uh, circular economy action plan which now, uh, as I already said, will have much wider focus. It's not any more traditional waste management uh, alone, but it, it is much more now about the design of products, also really bringing in and trying to change our consumption habits. It is also about uh, focus on specific uh, areas and uh, maybe it's worth to mention those areas also because this is uh, these are the priority areas where there will be a specific uh, strategies and actions developed and uh, just to name them uh, first of all of course uh, plastic uh, this is uh, this is one of the most uh, i would say challenging areas uh, i will come back to that uh, also soon but also electronics and ict uh, uh, batteries and vehicles. This is because of the very fast development uh, in the uh, mobility sector, because there will be lots of uh, new batteries available because of the uh, electricity based mobility system development. Then specific areas related to, uh, again, our consumption habits, such as textiles, food, and then of course, construction and building materials. And, and this sector in, in itself, because 50% uh, of the resources that we uh, consume every day, they are related mainly on buildings and uh, construction activities. So these are the specific priority areas where there will be specific strategies and actions developed uh, in coming years. And there will be lots of uh, 
new requirements and uh, also targets related to those uh, specific areas. Can you jump into the next slide, please? And this is just to illustrate that, uh, that uh, the overall view in this circular economy uh, new approach is not only uh, end of life or basically waste management. As you can see, the whole life cycle of products will be covered. And there are many other kind of uh, regulations or areas of regulations, which also now will be integrated under the circular economy. And maybe it's worth to mention uh, uh, use of materials and then, of course, the uh, REACH or let's say European Union chemicals policy is one of those driving uh, uh, legal uh, areas where there is a lot of uh, new uh, developments going on. Um, of course, design and uh, production, this is first of all related to specific uh, requirements on specific products. At the moment, the main focus has been on uh, products which consume electricity or energy, but in the future, there will be also very specific requirements concerning the material use and the circularity. And uh, what is a specific focus area with where there is definitely less attention put earlier, this is related to consumption and use. There will be uh, most probably also several uh, new uh, pieces of legislation, but also such issues like uh, eco-labels, uh, uh, public uh, green uh, or procurement, uh, and this is these are the areas which should also contribute into the prevention of uh, waste generation. So, as you can see, the, tomorrow's uh, waste related or let's say resource use and waste related uh, European Union regulatory uh, framework will be much wider than today's uh, waste management related uh, directives and regulations. So from that point of view, you can see that this is not only a task for, for let's say environmental related authorities, but it should be much, much, much wider. Okay, let's jump to the next slide. And very briefly, you know, most of you already know that uh, still, uh, although uh, the focus will be wider under the circular economy framework, we still uh, see that uh, most of the targets uh, established by different European Union uh, waste related directives are still related to uh, recycling. So this uh, 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 heavy or let's say a significant increase of, of recycling, which is required and just to name some of them, there is this gradual progress to 65% recycling uh, when it comes to uh, waste, municipal waste uh, by 2035. This is, I would say, one of the biggest challenges for some of the member states. And I would say also for Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, I, I think this recycling uh, related, uh, how to improve the recycling of municipal waste, this is definitely one of the challenges. And then the other issue, which is related to less uh, landfilling. So cutting down the landfilling and uh, by 2035, uh, the landfilling should be uh, below 10% in each member state. And I would say this is also from the Bosnian and Herzegovina point of view, one of the most uh, urgent uh, or most uh, like a kind of priority area where there is a need to put more uh, attention and ten attention. And of course, in parallel with uh, with packaging recycling, increasing uh, targets for uh, recycling of packaging, also challenging, is especially when it comes to the plastic as a material. As you see, the the biggest jump in concerning the recycling requirements or targets is targets is related to plastic packaging. This is a big challenge, really a challenge also here in Estonia. You know, really, how to ensure. Um, uh, higher or let's say more recycling when it comes to this very difficult uh, material or waste stream, which is the plastics. Uh, also some other areas uh, or let's say packaging materials, I would like to mention maybe glass as such uh, in Estonia, this is definitely a challenge because it's mainly related to uh, consumption uh, in uh, households and, uh, and more in general uh, sales packaging. It's very difficult to, to collect uh, glass uh, in, in a way uh, in bulk and uh, also it's quite uh, costly uh, to collect it. 
And there will be also new developments when it comes to the calculation, on how to calculate and really report to the European Commission when it comes to recycling targets. This is something where there is a real mess at the moment in the European Union. Different countries have their own uh, kind of uh, calculation uh, reporting systems, and you see we see very big differences among uh, those EU member states. And uh, this is definitely an issue. Now, how really to ensure that uh, all member states follow the same rules and uh, the figures which are reported by the member states, they should be comparable and really uh, should be transparent. And this is something which is, I would say, one of the challenges and definitely a challenge for Bosnia and Herzegovina because it's already now important to develop a really uh, smart uh, system to, to uh, collect this information and also to monitor the system. So it's, it's I would say, one of the challenges for, for your country also. Let's jump to the next uh, slide. I to mention that uh, we are out of time, so please uh, try to wrap up. Yeah, very, very briefly, just to indicate some of the issues which are rela very rela rela important. Uh, and uh, one of those, as I said, it's related to the plastics. A specific plastic strategy under the circular economy action plan. You can see there's a lots of uh, challenging uh, requirements, especially when it comes to single-use plastic. There's many types of uh, plastic-related products which uh, will be banned. Uh, and when it comes to plastic bottles, you see the specific targets which have to be achieved uh, by uh, the end of uh, this decade. We can see that this high level of recycling of plastic bottles uh, can be achieved uh, via only, I would say, the deposit system, uh, which we also would like to uh, a little bit discuss with you and show you the, the examples of Estonia. I would say one of the biggest success cases, uh, the deposit system for beverage packaging. And if we qu quickly jump on, then uh, I'm not going to you know, go in details when it comes to new uh, next uh, targets uh, and issues which are on the table, but just to mention some of them, bio-waste collection, which will be uh, mandatory by 2030, 2023. It's important because if you would like to achieve the recycling target of the municipal waste, then it's not enough to collect packaging waste. Packaging waste is only one third of the uh, municipal waste stream. The, the other one third is, is formed by the bio waste. So really, you should already start to think, you know, how to collect the bio waste, food waste, you know, how to ensure the recycling of this waste stream. And then, of course, to indicate the textile waste, which is also not so big a stream in the municipal waste. I would say it is somewhere around 5%, but still you can see that there will be requirements to organize a separate collection of this type of waste streams also. And now when we jump on, this is just to indicate the current situation, but I think you can later on also yourself uh, see uh, what is the situation and where Bosnia and, and the Herzegovina would fit in this uh, bigger but uh, figure, but as you can see, uh, you know the, the and then if, if you if you take another slide, you can see that uh, that the the main you know aim is to increase recycling uh, and then at the same time, of course, uh, prevention of uh, waste generation. The prevention of waste generation is one of the biggest challenges because it's, if you are in the curve of consuming more and hopefully also both uh, Estonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina will enjoy the economic growth and it's very, very difficult to cut down the amounts of waste. Uh, and if you jump another slide, just to show you again the, the picture here, you know, as you can see, it's the big variety when it comes to different member states uh, concerning the recycling, uh, landfilling. So it's really... Uh, big difference uh, here. And uh, that's why uh, this also a little bit illustrates the different uh, approaches and strategies on how these different countries have tried to solve the or reach the EU uh, waste policy targets. And uh, maybe another, and which is, I, I, I hope, the final slide. Again, here I'm not going to spend too much time. I will leave... Uh, uh, the floor for uh, Peter to cover some of those issues, but just to indicate uh, 
very important first step, which uh, I think Estonia did correctly. This is the relatively high landfill tax, which really allowed us to uh, leave uh, the, the landfilling as such and really to go forward to uh, more recovery and recycling. And the key, uh, uh, I would say, measure here is uh, landfill tax, which I think it's a crucial issue to discuss also in Bosnia-Herzegovina. As you also heard earlier, very challenging uh, uh, recycling targets for especially plastic and plastic bottles. You can't do it without a deposit system. It's more or less clear. So you should really think on how to introduce the deposit system for beverage packaging. Um, again, you know, how to organize this uh, system. This is something that we will discuss today. You know, what is the role of municipalities, private sector, and so on. In Estonia, we have failed in a way. We have not really involved municipalities. They are not very strong and uh, motivated to be part of the municipal waste management system. And as we can see, almost 10 years, there is no real uh, success when it comes to uh, recycling. So this type of lessons, uh, I think we would like to share with you. And uh, I have already consumed more uh, time. I know that Peter will do the same, I'm pretty sure. So Irem, hopefully you will you will somehow, you know, solve the problem, but uh, I will stop here my, my presentation and uh, give a floor to Peter. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, we will try to fit in. Uh, it's really interesting and uh, I hope that our uh, attendees are enjoying. Hvala velika, jako interesantna predavanje. Nadam se da svi učesnici uživaju. Thank you. I believe, I'm confident that our participants are enjoying and receiving very important information, especially from the point of view of our strategic planning. At the end, we'll have a panel discussion, question and answer discussion, since this is a, a Zoom that supports webinars. You can ask your questions uh, in the chat uh, that you can find uh, in the bottom menu. You can start asking questions immediately and we will take them afterwards and uh, provide answers. Now I invite Mr. Peter Ick to give his presentation of experiences from Estonia in the context of uh, alignment with the EU legislation in waste management to explain how the negotiations went on and present the main challenges that Estonia faced in the process. Just very briefly, Mr. Peter is working in waste management for over 30 years in the public sector and he participated in uh, the whole process of uh, harmonization with the EU legislation. He is currently working as a private consultant in earth care consulting company. So his experience as the general manager of the waste department uh, within the Ministry of uh, Environment of Estonia will of great, be of great interest for our administrative staff and our ministry staff to hear this uh, next presentation. Peter, the floor is yours. Dobre um, jutro from my side. And uh, could you please uh, switch to the slides? Or I, I will share this one. Uh, oh yeah, good. And uh, let's start and I, I tried to use the time given uh, to cover the process, how the Estonia joined uh, the EU and what was the preparatory work for it. Uh, and, and after all, so that means that the part being there already, uh, the part of implementation, so to say. So let's start, next slide. Uh, so there, there is just uh, dates uh, when and how Estonia um, came closer to the European Union, uh, more or less after gaining or regaining independence 91. Four years later, already Estonia applied uh, for the membership. 97, the uh, European Commission uh, decided to start negotiations. And uh, actually, they, they were started in um, 98. And uh, the full package of the negotiations, not only the environmental uh, issues, all, all EU. Uh, that lasted four years and eight months, so it's a pretty long period anyway. And uh, yeah, well, it ended uh, that uh, we uh, joined to EU 2004 with the nine other Eastern uh, European uh, countries. Next slide, please. Uh, 
next slide. This is a title chest. And uh, now just looking back uh, how it all uh, developed that uh, there was already first uh, waste law in 1992. That was even, let's say that nobody didn't even even perhaps uh, dream very much yet about the uh, uh, European Union. It was so far. And at this very time, the economy collapsed and the living standard was very low and average salary was something like 50 euro per, uh, per person. And, and everybody remembers this time and uh, me personally too. It was uh, difficult times anyway. But even then, actually, a certain foundation to the waste management was laid. And with this law, for example, the waste permit system and waste reporting system and such things were put in place. And already in the mid 90s, uh, economy started to develop and uh, things got better. And, uh, and of course, this European Union uh, wasn't really just a dream, but something already on the screen uh, visible uh, when the negotiation started. And this very time, more or less, we had yet uh, uh, permitted already, I, I will emphasize here, permitted uh, dumping sites um, uh, up to 250 around. And there is just one picture that uh, very often such uh, countryside um, uh, dumping sites, uh, there was no control. And uh, obviously, if, the, if there was no control, it was absolutely free of charge. <laughs> and that was rather terrible, uh, really, situation where to come uh, out, more or less. Next slide. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, that uh, 97 uh, negotiations started and uh, 2001 and uh, during this, uh, namely the period of the our negotiations, uh, there was um, adopted uh, the EU land fee directive 99 and Estonia transposed this uh, land fee directive uh, 2001, uh, more or less at the time when we really finished the negotiations. And that was uh, rather, I would say, even a breaking point uh, of this old style or old model in the waste management. And um, principally, here is a picture how it showed even a couple of years later, where Tallinn, the biggest landfill, uh, municipal waste landfill in Estonia, the ditch around the landfill looked. This is more or less the leached water with any kind of litter. Pretty nasty picture was it uh, indeed. But uh, speaking about this 2001, when this uh, landfill uh, regulation was issued in Estonia, transposing the landfill directive, uh, there was for the all existing landfills were a couple of very simple rules or requirements. And uh, principally up to the end of the 2001, that means rather relatively short time, half a year, was required that um, every such a small landfill uh, will install a waste bridge, uh, have to install the uh, fence around and uh, should guarantee the uh, working hours uh, control. That means that uh, uh, somebody worker there controlling what is both and so on. And uh, the regulation didn't say anything particular when this or this landfill should be closed, but just giving the option that whether you will uh, make those investments, owners of the landfills, or it should be closed. And uh, principally already during this 2001, uh, more than half uh, or, or quite a big number of the small landfills just in itself uh, made the decision that, okay, we will close this landfill, we will not invest into this landfill anymore. So that was rather, um, let's say, um, uh, good uh, approach, I think so. Not directly forcing, but just putting some uh, simple demands. Next slide. Uh, well, and uh, then uh, 1991, uh, that is about the uh, packages, uh, uh, came already uh, the first uh, packaging act. Uh, uh, just to remind that uh, 94, there was issued uh, a packaging directive. Although this act, uh, if you look now, it was perhaps a little bit uh, simple and did it uh, uh, emphasize uh, yet very clearly this. Uh, uh, extended producer responsibility and so on, but but some basics already were there. And in 1996, uh, um, uh, the support, so to say, to the packaging uh, act itself uh, was packaging excise duty. We, we could call it simply also packaging tax. But uh, the idea there is, I think in many countries, it's the same uh, approach, um, although in different names uh, might be that uh, uh, there are defined uh, the recycling and recovery targets. And now, um, let's say, on the level of the single uh, companies or whether it goes uh, through the, and most it goes through the packaging organizations, 
there are then summarized um, uh, targets. And if the targets are fulfilled, then there is no tax. But if there is um, under uh, achievement of the targets, then the gap between the target and the achieved level will be taxed. And the tax is, in this case, let's say much higher. In our case, it is approximately four times higher than would be the average uh, price uh, to be paid uh, for the waste management sector uh, to achieve uh, the target, so to say. And this has been definitely very, very important um, economic measure uh, to motivate uh, the packaging uh, collection and recycling. Next slide. Um, well, and um, uh, about uh, institutional development, I would say in the 1990s, as uh, Harry already also described, that uh, we had from one side a uh, big number of the small municipalities, which was a problem. And uh, although there was made also uh, attempts to uh, push through the administrative reform and reduce the number of the municipalities, uh, that ended up finally uh, only 2017. It took mostly 2000. 20 years, that was strange, but uh, true. Uh, but on this very 90s, uh, mostly uh, in the beginning, at least, uh, uh, most of the municipalities or, or the bigger municipalities, they had their own municipal um, uh, waste management companies and they started to uh, privatize them. There was the full, I mean, 90s was uh, privatization. Everything state owned, municipal owned, mostly was privatized and also waste management. And it is later to say perhaps it was even privatized a bit, little bit too much. But anyway, uh, such a collection sector somewhere in the early 2000s already was more or less fully in the private hands. Um, and uh, later on, especially when we started to establish a new regional landfills, then was uh, one uh, reason to bring the municipalities back to the waste management because the rules of the financing didn't really definitely allow to give a big financial support to the private companies, but to the public companies. And so uh, the first approach uh, with the new landfills or waste management sector uh, centers uh, was uh, namely that those were the municipal companies then established. Um, and uh, yeah, well, and uh, as I said, that this uh, 1999 uh, came the directive uh, of the landfills, uh, uh, landfill directive, and that uh, changed uh, the, the whole uh, waste management uh, basically. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here is just uh, our, just nothing but um, uh, the, the development of the Waste Act that the first was 1992, that was very simple and very short in today's comparison. Then we had like uh, um, intermediate uh, law uh, for the transposition period, which already transposed, uh, um, no, let's say, most part of existing this time uh, EU um, requirements. But uh, for the 2004, uh, it came forth exactly on the same day when Estonia became a member state, uh, there came to force uh, the new uh, Waste Act, Full Act, also Packaging Act, principally separately. And uh, this already then implemented uh, the, all the newer directives which were issued uh, there, for example, the 2000 uh, end of life vehicles, 2002 uh, waste electric electronic um, uh, uh, directive and so on. So it means that this uh, extended producer responsibility um, uh, in more broader um, sense than only packages. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, well, and um, just sh shortly to describe that uh, how uh, the process uh, uh, went um, um, of these uh, negotiations and preparations. And uh, uh, this is uh, definitely a very serious uh, issue in all uh, countries uh, which have uh, been, uh, which have had those negotiations being uh, conducted country first. And um, clearly it starts from the very detailed homework that is absolutely required. And um, although that was for us, it was already 20 years ago and the situation is very different uh, if to look at which directives uh, EU law existed this time and where it have uh, developed today. And the package is uh, much, much more challenging, that's for sure. But uh, the principle uh, have remained, uh, most likely at least. That means that uh, there is going on the saving uh, by each directive. And uh, that means that every candidate country have to make a special file 
uh, what is uh, really already implemented uh, um, concerning this directive, what uh, remains to be um, transposed um, in the sense of the legislation, but then it comes definitely to the implementation. And implementation means uh, like basic two things. One is the institutions, whether there are already institutions uh, clearly established and uh, targeted or not uh, targeted, but um, really given power uh, by uh, legislation who are responsible to do this or this or this. And the second thing is definitely also the, uh, in, uh, the investments because the change of the waste management in uh, any country, uh, as, as it was in Estonia, definitely in Bosnia, Herzegovina also, that requires a huge amount of uh, investments. And in a short time, it is not possible to cover those investments with a very basic idea that is in the waste management, that is the producer pays. In the long run, the producer pays uh, have to cover the cost, but in a short run, uh, during those changes, that's not possible. And uh, usually, and I think that it will be a case also for Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, that uh, EU funds will be made available and that will help a lot of, but regardless of that, there should be always uh, local, um, uh, local financial instruments which will support it, definitely. Next slide. Um, so, and yeah, this is uh, uh, already uh, about uh, uh, negotiations and um, uh, implementation period. And in our case, uh, in the 90s, we had pretty much of uh, support, uh, both, uh, let's say, uh, like a knowledge side and also investment side from the Denmark, uh, because the Scandinavian countries here um, uh, were very, very visible in the, in the Baltic region, especially. Um, and um, uh, as I said, that um, uh, every directive uh, requires uh, very detailed analyze um, uh, how to um, how to implement it, and uh, definitely also uh, on the. Uh, um, on the, on the, if, if, if it means that uh, um, the new landfill uh, should be placed on waste management center, there is definitely needed also the, in that very sense to analyze that uh, which waste streams right now we have and which uh, waste streams we have to um, face uh, after, let's say, five years, ten years, uh, uh, that sort of analysis uh, also uh, or, or always needed. Um, and uh, this is uh, why the um, uh, um, waste management um, uh, planning uh, is a very useful uh, tool and the waste management planning of course is uh, required by a directive uh, in general way it does uh, not say that on which levels it uh, says that uh, whether in national level or in regional level this is up to the every uh, member state or candidate country to decide uh, in uh, in Estonia that was uh, done at the beginning, even on the three levels to try to make uh, on the national level, then on the county or regional level, and then on the municipal level. Uh, later on, the county level is uh, really left out, and but still there is a national waste management plan and, uh, and also required uh, that the municipalities will uh, have to prepare their own um, uh, plans. Uh, next slide. Peter, just to just to uh, jump in and say that we uh, are out of time. I see you have twenty slides more, but just to let you know that uh, you kind of should uh, wrap up. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I will here bring up just one very important uh, point. Um, uh, Harry already referred to, and uh, this is nothing uh, really to take uh, very exactly the example that is our case with our uh, oil shell issue. But uh, what I want to emphasize uh, is that um, uh, going to those negotiations, preparing to those negotiations, it's definitely clear to um, uh, to find out and uh, to make clear what is uh, the absolute uh, um, priority uh, for, uh, for example, for the Bosnia Herzegovina. And uh, then to try to use uh, definitely a rather limited space uh, for exemptions uh, for those uh, high priority areas. Because uh, that was said also for Estonia, I mean, during those negotiations and before and, and so on, that uh, this is definitely not a very useful approach if you would uh, come up and to apply uh, the exemptions uh, for the, let's say, many 
uh, requirements in EU because the process itself by is like um, considered that the candidate country have to demonstrate that they are already almost uh, there, that they are able to implement uh, the EU legislation in a big part, at least in the majority. And there, yes, indeed, there could be some questions where certain extra extra um, conditions, uh, usually it means that a cer certain prolongation, certain extra time is given. So that's very difficult. And if I just compare our so southern neighbors, Latvia, Lithuania, other Eastern European countries, many of them applied uh, the extra time for the implementation of the landfill directive, how long the old landfills uh, could be used and so on and so on. In our case, this is just to say that uh, there was consideration that energy sector is the highest priority and we have to cover the energy sector needs and uh, this uh, extra exemptions were asked only for the energy sector. That means that all other terms also in, uh, in the landfill directive uh, were applied exactly as was given in the directive. All other in the extended producer responsibility were applied exactly as was required in the, in the directive. And this is perhaps uh, um, to say that um, uh, th this is uh, a serious issue and uh, also for the Bosnia and Herzegovina would be uh, very important to figure out which issues are the utmost importance and not to, and uh, let's say priorities, one, two, three, not more. And, and others should somehow be taken that we have to implement them uh, as they are and uh, we have to work hard if needed. So this is uh, perhaps from my side with this uh, intervention right now. Yeah, this is just a picture how it looked our oil shale um, uh, power stations landfills and this is uh, in this very time it was but that's just the history already today definitely that it was uh, like considered that this is not in line with the landfill directive uh, to pump uh, that ash to the landfill with the water mixture and uh, there was like a consideration that that should be ended 2009, but later on, although they did put a really lot of money into this in the research, there was not found any workable solution and, and was agreed again with the European Commission that uh, this um, pumping with uh, water mixture where, where water is uh, finally considered as a transport uh, carrier of the, of the ash and ash is itself not the liquid. <laughs> that is, the, let's say the uh, more or less a consideration interpretation of the directive. So uh, nothing more that uh, you have to also figure out what is your uh, crucial issue for the economy, for the, for the country as such. Yeah, and uh, there is perhaps um, uh, to say yet that uh, uh, beside uh, of, the, of the, let's say average uh, municipal waste, there is uh, uh, those, uh, Waste streams, which are covered already by EU with the extended producer responsibility, uh, waste electric, electronic uh, batteries, uh, then uh, all packaged material and so on. And um, there is um, need to develop uh, the recycling uh, industry uh, also as much. And of course, this is not the straightforward that everything should be recycled uh, locally, uh, which is obviously not even possible perhaps, but, but at least to find out that which uh, uh, companies uh, could uh, do something and to try to find also the financial means how to support them. Uh, well, we have only one class recycling factory, but they are also limiting themselves uh, to the transparent Class. That means class to class, back to the new jars and bottles. But then again, there is perhaps not a, a first preference, but anyway, uh, that is recycling. Uh, some companies are producing pavement stones, uh, putting the glass collets, fine glass collets to the, to the concrete, for example. So this is more or less uh, simple uh, or much simpler um, industrial process. There are um, not yet, but I know that there are coming, obviously, uh, some uh, producers who would like to produce uh, the glass foam uh, from the glass. So, so this is like insulation material, uh, rather quality, high quality material, and uh, definitely not comparable in the in the sense of the investments needed. Uh, then it would be remelting, uh, total remelting to the new glass product. So it is um, to say that perhaps such a simpler, more simpler uh, recycling uh, methods could be. Uh, watched uh, and, uh, and looked. 
And of course, if there is uh, no big metallurgy installation, um, there's nothing to do. And that's usually not the big because the metal is well traded. Uh, paper might be partly the same if there is some neighboring countries to look how it uh, cooperates. Plastic, again, it's a big, big, big uh, problem as uh, Ari also covered. And uh, the new targets on the plastic weights, they are going pretty high, pretty demanding. But that is perhaps the positive side is that the plastic recycling could be done in rather let's say small or medium size enterprises also. It is not necessarily the very big plants needed only. So it means that um, this is how to um, ignite uh, certain uh, new initiatives and the private sector, definitely and the private sector, usually what I mentioned. So this is a new country, usually the, uh, the state owned or, or even municipally owned, although it could be something, of course, not, nothing wrong. But, but anyway, how to bring the private uh, um, investments into the waste management, especially to the recycling. So this is an important issue. So I don't know. Uh, are we time over or or just? Uh, uh, but yes, uh, we are. But uh, if there's something interesting regarding the landfill closure, and uh, you can yeah, well, just uh, scroll um, scroll further. And here is that uh, what our experience is that the new landfills uh, uh, that is um, uh, very in investment rich objects. So this is uh, first thing. And uh, here is uh, just uh, our experience how we cover the the old landfills um, and uh, in the in the 90, in the beginning of the 90s, there was uh, 300, then it was 200, and then in the moment when the landfill directive was transposed, 150. So it reduced uh, remarkably already during the 90s, and then rapidly after that. And of course, most of them they were very small, one two hectares, and mostly they were covered also in a, let's say simplified manner, usually giving um, more or less uh, hill, uh, little hill, uh, uh, couple uh, uh, shape, and then covered by one meter, two meter perhaps the soil that was very average of course there were some cases where there was uh, very clear that uh, local groundwater is is uh, contaminated and in some cases also the cover of the landfills was much more also plastic layers were used in a couple of places but big landfills were were really covered uh, very carefully and and rather extensive way so that was 1991 so the the map of the country very dotted very dotted so next and uh, uh, here we see, uh, yeah, the, the closure, um, cost of the closure. Uh, that means that uh, the peak landfills, all, all it uh, together uh, was um, uh, in the smaller landfills, uh, it was uh, really uh, relatively cheap or, or um, not, not very ex ex expensive exercise anyway. And uh, the financing method we used was the same that uh, the most or nearly all, let's let's say so, those municipal waste landfills were municipally owned. Um, and uh, But municipalities didn't have money really for it. And so the closure of uh, those uh, was performed uh, in a model that 10% uh, uh, usually, that changed a little bit, but uh, average pay the municipalities and 90% uh, the, there is a, uh, center of the environmental investments established, uh, which really gets their money mostly from the environmental taxes, including landfill tax. And uh, they are really uh, the authority dividing or dealing with the EU supports on that field, both of, and uh, means that those Estonian own um, resources also were divided to those projects plus European. So it was uh, in big part anyway, this closer project was, uh, was uh, supported um, by state and um, the, the most part of the closure of the landfills, uh, those municipal landfills was 30 plus millions uh, uh, per 1.3 million uh, people if to calculate some close to 33 uh, euros per, uh, per inhabitant. So just to compare that, that would be the comparable number uh, perhaps. And um, uh, yeah, well, with the industrial, uh, industrial landfills uh, also um, considering then it, was another 100 million. Uh, that was much more expensive, definitely. And this is to emphasize all the time that not only municipal waste, not only municipal um, landfills, but also industrial and mining uh, waste uh, heaps and, and so on. So next. 
And uh, this is uh, just to say that uh, all those, also in Estonia, there were many people uh, who considered uh, that the landfill directive or the implementation, this is just about the landfill, just to, let's close the old one, let's uh, build the new ones and uh, that's done actually. But it's uh, very much more complicated. It requires the rearrangement, uh, the old waste management system. And first thing what it requires is uh, the, uh, collection system that should ensure that uh, nearly 100% of the households and other generators of the municipal waste are covered with the collection. So this is absolutely uh, first priority in these changes. And uh, the another is definitely the need to uh, offer, to uh, develop um, and to offer the service of the waste stations. We call them waste stations. In the British English, they call them usually civic amenity sites or recycling yards. So they have many names, but uh, uh, the idea is the same. So let's uh, move next. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, the same. I already said that um, uh, the local way stations, public amenity sites are absolutely needed. Because why? Uh, the, the, the clear explanation is that to avoid uh, the wild dumping, to avoid the littering, you have to offer the alternative. And the people can't really take or put everything to the container, so this is not possible. And secondly, uh, this is also needed for the recycling. You have to uh, collect the certain types of the waste uh, also for the recycling. And here are those uh, civic amenity sites, the recycling yards, very, very useful object. And this is a network. It takes time to develop them. We have in Estonia, I think, roughly 100 of uh, waste stations today. Uh, so it means that in bigger cities, um, four or five, uh, at least several, and uh, in most of the municipalities, uh, one or, or in smaller municipalities still they have one for, for a certain region actually. And uh, this is an issue in that very sense that um, this is also investment. Uh, the average uh, waste station uh, have been uh, with the price stock, let's say close to 200 to 300,000 euro. And yet it is also operational cost uh, related. So usually something around 20 to 30,000 euro per year is also operational cost. And uh, in both cases, uh, there should be um, decided that where it comes. And the investment, again, in Estonia, big part from the state, but the operational cost, uh, this is uh, up to the municipalities. So uh, next, if, if there is time, but if not, yeah, this is just a picture how the biggest um, municipal waste landfills near Tallinn uh, looked uh, after the closure. Uh, and there in the corner, in the right corner, you may see that this is uh, today operating one of the Tallinn city uh, civic amenity sites. So this area is in a way uh, still in use. Uh, next. And so this is exactly what I said, uh, perhaps this about uh, uh, civic amenity sites um, and uh, the need to join the households to the collection. And in 2001, that means that uh, more or less uh, yet in the middle of the negotiations, there was made a study and that showed that 79% uh, of the households were joined to the system means 21% of population was outside of co um, co collection system. Nobody knew where they were, did uh, put their waste. And uh, some years later, or 2012, it was uh, considered 95. So it means that it's uh, 100 is perhaps even not easily achievable. Although there are countries like Denmark uh, where there is uh, principally impossible to be outside. If there is a uh, property where there is a living rooms, that is already counted uh, to the waste management system and you are charged. Whether you are living there or not living, that's not the problem. So next, uh, this is a new, uh, the small map is showing where the new landfills um, are, are standing and uh, five of them and uh, perhaps uh, uh, that in the long run, this uh, might be our investment. We don't need them uh, perhaps too much. But uh, if I compare again uh, our southern neighbors, I think that they did uh, um, invest uh, more to the landfills and also our investments took place in a, in a bigger share. Although I agree that also in Estonia there was. And the one ex uh, example that the picture is that also in, not in all, but in uh, a couple, I think, uh, new landfills also EU funds were used. Uh, other were also uh, Estonian own uh, financing resources. Um, next. And so this is just the industrial landfills. Next slide. Um, that was one uh, industrial uh, landfill, uh, rather difficult really to close because there were some thermal processes. Yes, next slide. 
Tar Lakes, uh, nasty, nasty heritage, so to say. Uh, next slide. And so this is on, uh, on industrial waste, uh, hazardous waste also landfill after the closure covered with, um, with uh, limestone and, uh, and some plantation were put there and it looks much nicer today. Next slide. And so this is one of the industrial landfills, big ones, really big ones. <laughs> you can see perhaps on the picture. Next, next slide. And so this is one um, oil shale ash landfill, which was recultivated so that on the top of it was uh, the wind farm was uh, established. So that was very good um, kind of solution that um, uh, old landfills, which didn't have a very big uh, use of, now it produce energy. Next slide. So, but I think that the time is over, so I will stop here or... Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Hvala gospodinu Peteru. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peter. This presentation was very detailed, very thorough. Uh, since according to the agenda, we have a break scheduled, let's shorten it to five minutes and let's come back here at 10.15. There are many questions and we would really like to finish the presentations at the uh, time in order to be able to answer the questions. We received uh, uh, quite a lot of similar questions, so we will put them together. So let's uh, meet again at 10.15 uh, to see the new presentation. Thank you.
Uh, evo već je 10 i 15. Nadam se da... I hope you are all back, that we can continue. Our colleagues from Estonia are hopefully back also. The next presentation is about the transformation of the waste management system in Estonia. In principle, we expect them to share their experience of the main principles and challenges and the turning point that happened in the hierarchy of waste management and what are the experiences, which meant that they went away from the waste disposal landfilling to circular economy. This presentation is a joint presentation and also shares the another one on factors. Uh, I believe it will be started by Mr. Peter. So I give the floor to Mr. Peter to proceed. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, indeed, uh, this is a big challenge and this is something that obviously could never be 100% achieved because the circular economy is a certain, uh, um, let's say, ideal. You have to move towards, but you will touch uh, not finally, uh, more or less. But anyway, um, exactly that uh, waste management uh, should uh, uh, lead to, and I would start here that uh, it's extremely um, important to implement uh, a very coherent and uh, let's say even strict uh, waste regime. Uh, and waste regime comes from the, this, uh, let's say, term is used in the EU uh, terminology. And that means that everything concerning with the waste should be covered with uh, waste uh, permits. Now, that means that all actors working on the waste should be covered with the waste permits. And if somebody is giving to somebody uh, waste that also the, who will uh, um, uh, receive it uh, should have waste permit until it is recycled and already classified as a non-waste. There could be made uh, exemptions, they are needed, but I mean generally. And secondly, that means that um, everything that is done with the waste, every process uh, should be really foreseen in the permits, uh, starting from the definitely landfilling, but later on, uh, whether somebody is storaging waste, somebody is sorting, somebody is really treating it, uh, somebody is recycling, that is all uh, waste, um, uh, waste treatment, that's uh, important. Second thing that I definitely would like to emphasize also is important to implement uh, as uh, in detail as possible, the waste um, uh, list, European waste list. I mean, generally everybody knows so that's uh, like a simple thing, but but uh, there is a tendency that uh, in many countries it is used in a very simple and perhaps oversimplified way. That means that a small number of the waste goes are used and many other waste streams which actually occur, which are generated, they are put to whether municipal waste, whether I don't know, in construction demolition waste very often, and there is only one good use for the construction demolition waste instead of using steel and concrete or uh, um, uh, tiles and concrete and uh, wood and uh, whatever other material based. So th this uh, comes really from the uh, from the waste collection. That means that the waste collection companies, whoever is uh, offering this service, uh, they have to be uh, careful uh, or, or intended really to this issue. Why it is needed? It is uh, first of all to understand that what is actually collected and where it all goes. Uh, and uh, it is very difficult to plan uh, certain changes and new installations and so on and so on if everything is put uh, to the one uh, pot, so to say, with a couple of small number of them uh, of the codes. So uh, just an ex Estonian example is that uh, the European list contains 850 roughly, and we have in a waste uh, report some 450 uh, code so more or less but uh, but also sometimes we have uh, the another problem that uh, there, there are codes but uh, they're still uh, described with uh, with uh, wrong codes than uh, with the very general codes and so on and definitely the same goes uh, for the r and t codes that means that recovery including recycling and disposal and um, of course if the recycling is not very developed then more or less uh, everything is, uh, is the disposal uh, codes but uh, especially as uh, recycling and recovery uh, will um, uh, develop and that should be developed. 
then which goods are used and what is exactly the recycling, what these other forms of re recovery. This comes uh, uh, with uh, much more um, um, important uh, uh, level as it is perhaps today, just to consider. So next slide, perhaps. And yeah, well, one is what I just uh, here wanted to say is that I think it's very useful. It's not required exactly, but it's uh, been very useful in Estonia. We have done it roughly after five, six years. It's a general study uh, on the composition of the mixed waste and also uh, collected packaging waste. And that gives you insight that uh, first, uh, how the certain initiatives on the soil separation have worked, how much it have affected. And secondly, definitely it gives uh, uh, the potential of the uh, source separation because what is not yet source separated. So this is usually in the mixed waste and uh, you can't really source separate more than there is paper or, or plastics or metal in the mixed municipal waste. Yet you have, to, of course, it's understandable, but um, practically you can never sort out 100% of certain material. But anyway, it gives you um, the potential. And definitely the hierarchy of the waste management, which is uh, from the beginning of the 90s part of the EU waste legislation, and Harry Mora already mentioned the uh, circular economy, which is like a new concept, but uh, if you look, then uh, I think that in a, in a central part, it also includes the waste hierarchy, but now this is the first levels of the hierarchy, the prevention, and, and of course reuse, uh, no, those have just uh, given uh, totally new uh, type of shine, uh, perhaps. Uh, um, yep, let's take next one. And uh, here is uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the uh, extended producer responsibility uh, uh, as a concept included in the EU legislation is, is definitely challenging from one side, uh, but also very important to solve a certain environmental problems. And uh, uh, that's, of course, uh, perhaps interesting that somewhere in the early 2000s, there was a uh, kind of very positive mood and expectation that there going to be much more uh, waste streams, material streams covered with uh, EPR, extended producer responsibility on the EU level. But just after the 2006 the battery directive, um, uh, no new such directives have been issued. Of course, we can here say that this uh, uh, reduction of the certain plastic um, uh, one way plastic items or this uh, single use plastic directive also implements uh, uh, the extended producer, producer responsibility to the very, um, let's say, narrow targeted uh, area of the plastic products, including the uh, cigarette filters, for example. But, but this is a just example. But anyway, that means that why? why? And the answer is that uh, the extended producer responsibility is not so si simple as it uh, uh, seems uh, first it does indeed allow to organize the collection of those waste types so that the costs are targeted to the producers or to those who are putting uh, the goods to the market. But yet uh, the extended producer responsibility is always uh, very challenging also for the public sector, for the state. First of all, to the state or regional authorities, uh, that means that you um, should have their uh, the good uh, registers. You should register both producers and the products, and this is the basis uh, where you can uh, uh, really follow whether the producers are uh, really uh, doing what is required. Uh, and the second thing is that. Uh, um, there are always uh, so-called free riders who are not uh, really participating. And this comes then, uh, of course, the issue of the competition. Uh, those who are not uh, participating, uh, they are getting the better position on the market. So state definitely has, uh, state authorities have uh, one obligation to guarantee the equal conditions on the on the market and uh, then it comes that they have to follow those free riders so this is and then therefore i think that uh, it's it's not so simple yes um, uh, as it seems but then again um, the directives uh, allow the member states to implement also itself uh, extend the producer responsibility beside uh, the eu requirements and uh, many countries have done it. Uh, the France is a champion here. They have uh, many waste streams. In Estonia, we have extended uh, the list of the beyond uh, the EU list. We have tires, 
and tires are in most of the European country, countries, except the Germany and a couple of others, but um, um, under the extended producer responsibility. And we have yet uh, the agriculture of plastic. It's not a very big stream, but it was considered a problematic. And one of the problems uh, we had then before was that uh, it was not considered exactly the packaging uh, when put to the market, but then it was started to collect and to show um, as recycled plastic packaging. So it was, uh, let's say, really blurring uh, the packaging uh, recycling um, uh, report and uh, well one way to avoid it is to say that there are extra rules and that works uh, on the same uh, so next slide um, and uh, here we have uh, the waste uh, national waste management plans um, and as i mentioned that uh, this requirement comes from the eu directive and uh, we have done uh, them uh, which are matching the eu financing period so far at least and um, in some other countries, uh, this have been not considered uh, a big issue, and those such uh, plans have been made up to 10 years or something like different periods anyway. Uh, and uh, the first the national waste management plan was uh, perhaps uh, important in that very sense that in the middle of this uh, period, the Estonia joined the EU. So that was mostly dealing with the landfill issue, or where to build, how many to build, how to uh, cover old ones, uh, what it costs, how to finance and so on and such things. Not exactly definite, there were all other issues also, but that was so, sort of uh, the, the first uh, issue, big issue. The second um, waste management plan already dealt the issue that how to divert the, the waste away from the landfills. Uh, there was a big discussion and analyze like uh, uh, where to, uh, how much uh, MBT for the mixed municipal waste or the incineration and so on, those comparisons. Um, and um, uh, the last one, which was, uh, now they are really working with a new one. The, there is actually, right now is uh, legally speaking a gap. There is uh, no valid uh, waste management plan. Uh, but uh, the third plan was really trying to target uh, towards the source operation and um, and recycling. It is definitely not to say uh, that only only those issues, but uh, uh, something above of others, perhaps that way. And uh, I think generally uh, the waste management plan have not been uh, kind of documented on a daily basis. Somebody would uh, read and look and and uh, really as a handbook, but but uh, really showing the direction. Uh, to the all levels of the decision makers, also politicians, and it has been important and uh, I think that useful. Uh, yeah, next. Next slide. Yeah, um, here is uh, economic instruments, as I said, that, um, uh, well, in Estonia we have uh, from the 90s already the landfill tax and definitely the landfill tax have been one of the most influential uh, economic instruments. Um, although it was at the beginning, it was very low. Uh, later on, there is a slide, a slide obviously about uh, separating. Uh, then we have this uh, packaging tax or excise duty on the packaging that already shortly explained that if the targets are not, only then if the targets are not achieved, then the producers have to pay. But anyway, these have been really very strong, convincing measure uh, that they would work uh, as much as possible uh, with the collection and recycling. Uh, and uh, there is uh, no such a, a general uh, uh, tax on the waste incineration, um, uh, although it has been also um, uh, discussed. And also the economic instrument is considered generally the um, uh, extended producer responsibility, which is uh, implied on packaging, uh, on um, uh, end of life of vehicles, on uh, we and, uh, and batteries, and uh, then, as I mentioned, also the tires and the uh, agriculture plastic. Agriculture plastic is is there on the on the picture also. Uh, next slide. And uh, what is uh, really the, been the influence um, uh, of the landfill tax? And uh, since 2015, it have not changed. It have been 30 euro per ton. It's not particularly very high. There are definitely in Europe there are much higher tax rates um, to see. But uh, from other end, it was enough uh, to uh, enable the investment uh, to the insulator. 
And it wasn't really uh, absolutely a new build. Uh, there was a power station working with the natural gas. So it was like uh, uh, the waste insulation block was added there and the uh, connection to the heat uh, uh, network and the electricity grid all was already there. So it was uh, enabling it. But anyway, the uh, investment was more than 100 million euro in 2013 and uh, this is actually yes this is a state-owned company but it's a company and they say that uh, without the uh, landfill tax which was influencing the landfill gate fee they were not been able to make this uh, investment and uh, just uh, making this investment means that uh, there was no financial support directly uh, to build it uh, they made their um, let's say financial plan and they took a credit from the bank and they did build it. And, and as I said, that uh, there was very, very important support role uh, from the landfill tax to, uh, to achieve it. This um, time, uh, the uh, landfill, uh, landfill gate fees, uh, price uh, that has to uh, be paid to landfill, you deliver the waste for something 50 to 60 euro. Uh, that means that without uh, uh, the waste uh, uh, landfill tax, it was something between 20 to, uh, to 40. Uh, or, or uh, and uh, now nowadays already uh, the uh, landfill gate fees are something like 80 to 200 uh, euro, and also gate uh, the incinerator gate fees have gone up. And uh, there have been even discussion to uh, introduce the uh, new tax for the uh, incineration and to raise the landfill tax, but so far those have not been adopted. So that just a discussion. So next slide. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, that this land with tax uh, since the 90s, and uh, the, it was paid uh, many years directly uh, to the Center on the Environmental Investments, uh, which also uh, dealt with uh, all EU funds uh, available. So it was like a two lines to apply. One was this Estonian own financial uh, means and uh, other uh, application uh, type of uh, line was for the EU supports. And uh, namely, this uh, landfill tax was a big, uh, important income source uh, to cover uh, those uh, needs uh, internally. Um, yeah, next. And this is just an example that um, looking also back to the, um, and only is to emphasize perhaps that there was a period and that this is uh, absolutely unavoidable that when you may have uh, uh, both new landfills uh, with the new engineered uh, bottoms and uh, leachate collection and so on and all investments made where understandably also the gate fee is much higher. And if somebody yet on certain reasons are keeping open uh, the gates on the old uh, landfill in some quarry, typically where no investments have been made, of course they could, if just left open, so to say, um, uh, offer this service with a much uh, lower price. In our case, that was leveled with, um, let's say, coefficient um, of factor that all non-compliant landfills, non-compliant means non-compliant with the landfill directive or landfill regulation uh, requirements, then, and they still were permitted to, to operate, then they had just much higher landfill tax. So this is, um, and also here you can see that uh, the oil shale um, um, waste, uh, also every waste has um, landfill tax, although they have had a much higher, uh, much lower level principally. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, and uh, the income from the landfill tax, it have been roughly in, um, in, of course, today it is smaller because uh, oil shale waste have been produced, uh, generated and landfilled in a much smaller um, amount, but uh, there was something like uh, 15 million uh, euro, that means something like 10 euros per inhabitant per country. And uh, from that, uh, roughly half if uh, uh, was uh, delivered back to the waste uh, sector projects. Uh, why not 100%? Because these environmental investment centers, uh, they also support uh, all kinds of environmental projects on environmental awareness, uh, on environmental education, on nature conservation, definitely. Uh, that means that there are a lot of um, areas where there is no uh, direct income, but the cost part, of course, is there. And therefore, yeah, this is one of the, of the ways uh, how to uh, cover those um, 
cost. Um, um, yeah, let's take uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, as I said, yes, that today already uh, the price or the gate fee uh, is uh, 70 to 90 something euro. Uh, every landfill in Estonia is a company and they can uh, decide itself the gate fee. This is not state controlled. And um, there are today, um, how, some of them are municipal companies or municipally owned companies, yeah? And some are private companies. And, and, but in all uh, those cases, uh, the companies are itself in position to decide what is the gate fee uh, they receive the waste. And as I said, that the gate fee always includes this uh, landfill tax, 30 euro per ton. But somewhere in the 2001, uh, when the land regulation was established, then it was maximum 10 euro uh, per ton. And uh, there is uh, clearly, um, again, to, uh, to emphasize that the landfill gate fee is always uh, the benchmark in the waste management sector, uh, where with which all other possible costs are, are compared. And if the landfill gate fee is kept uh, relatively low, then it simply doesn't really allow uh, to come and to invest to the alternatives uh, to the disposal of the landfilling. Would it be MBT? Would it be insulation? Would it be definitely recycling? Therefore, and of course, also in Estonia, there was uh, such a notion that um, but that about uh, low income people and, and there is a social problems and so on. And, and this is like a reason we have to keep uh, landfill prices uh, low. But I would say clearly that, yes, indeed, those social um, uh, questions or issues should be uh, um, understood. And, uh, but uh, the waste policy could not be, uh, is definitely not a good tool uh, to address those uh, social issues. There should be um, uh, instead uh, the social benefit system which would uh, support those families um, or persons in need. And also in Estonia, we have had, and still I think even have uh, uh, the social, uh, well, you have your living room costs. And if your uh, income is lower below a certain uh, level, then you can apply for the social uh, benefits uh, to support your, or to cover your living room cost. And the living room costs as such, they definitely include uh, electricity and heating, if this is central heating, something like this, but definitely, definitely also waste management cost. And waste management cost anyway, from the um, total uh, living uh, related, uh, housing related cost is very, very small amount. So that's not even significant, but, but put it that way, look the um, household housing and living room costs separately uh, from the needs of the waste management. So this is perhaps mm, to say. Next slide. Yeah, and this is uh, just um, um, land, uh, the packaging tax or the excise duty tax, as I said, and uh, there is uh, with the recycling and recovery targets. And uh, we see here um, that uh, the targets are uh, given like uh, differently or differentiated way for the uh, usual or container collection and for the deposit system, because uh, we also the deposit system since 2005 uh, for the uh, pet bottles, uh, metal cans and uh, glass bottles for the beer and beverages. And here is the principle is the same, but I already perhaps mentioned that uh, there are targets and if the targets are not met, then the tax uh, should be made uh, for the gap uh, remained. Uh, next slide. So now about the municipal waste. Um, and um, definitely um, one is uh, uh, who shall uh, or could um, uh, decide where it um, goes, how it is collected. And here is uh, in Estonia, uh, the approach is that this is uh, an obligation of the municipalities. Municipalities are obliged to organize, uh, to organize a tender. And uh, the different companies, um, mostly private companies uh, who could, and they participate on the, on the tenders. And then the winner of the tender is contracted. And uh, for the three years or up to five years period, uh, this company is um, really given a special right to collect the waste. And although the municipalities are not very often using it, but of course they have a power also to decide where exactly the waste is uh, delivered. Um, and um, 
uh, there, the collection goes uh, on the three uh, like uh, levels, so to say. One is uh, definitely the basic is uh, on the uh, property, or, or it is called also in English the door to door. Uh, but on the property. And uh, what is perhaps to emphasize, and I think that that might be difficult uh, for uh, for the country like Bosnia-Herzegovina, where the background is a little bit different, but, but still I think that to consider that there are practically in Estonia no public, uh, public uh, containers for the mixed municipal waste. So this is mixed municipal waste is all waste uh, the responsibility of the property owner. And of course, understandably, this is uh, not a big problem if we have uh, private houses or one family houses, let's say. But this is a big pro problem if we have uh, multi storage houses, dwellings in the towns and cities. But uh, at least, uh, yes, in Estonia, as I said, that every dwelling house is uh, considered like uh, uh, separate um, um, legal entity. There are uh, partnerships uh, of the flat owners, uh, or if it is, might be today in some cases that there is a property owner um, uh, who is just renting them out. And this is a target or targeted is yes, this owner company perhaps uh, of such a dwelling house. Anyway, the property owner is obliged to install uh, the containers. This is not even an obligation of the municipality. And um, uh, municipality is setting the rules which uh, houses uh, have uh, to have uh, containers and the uh, mixed municipal waste so this is absolutely understandable there is nothing to say but uh, our approach have been that uh, uh, for example the Tallinn city uh, uh, council uh, regulation said already that 2003 there should be um, paper and cardboard container uh, at the every more or less every dwelling house and since 2007 there should be a bio waste container at every dwelling house with more than 10 flats. Uh, so this has uh, been uh, the, the approach also how to emphasize or how to develop this uh, source separation. Why I'm um, really uh, considering this important is that if the mixed municipal waste containers are, let's say in the public room and they are not really linked to any particular property, that makes, I think, rather difficult to, um, uh, to implement uh, the source separation. Because the, if the people have a simple option to just to deliver the mixed waste to, uh, to the container somewhere in the streets, uh, how to motivate them really uh, to sort. So this is uh, just to consider. I'm not saying that it could not be, but um, on my opinion, it could be much uh, more difficult. Second level is uh, what do we have uh, is so-called public containers. And those are so far mostly packaging containers and today also uh, containers for the clothing, um, textile waste or, or reusable items, perhaps not even yet the waste. Uh, plus in some uh, municipalities also for the paper and cardboard. And the uh, third layer is this uh, uh, recycling stations or, or public amenity sites or how to call them. Uh, they are, they are not so um, close uh, often because in the countryside it could be up to 10, 15 kilometers in the local center somewhere in a small town usually. So it means that uh, this is a place where not every family, every person goes every day, perhaps not even every week. Uh, but many people definitely visit it uh, weekly or, or once, uh, once a month or something like this. But as I already uh, mentioned uh, before, uh, this network of the public amenity sites is extremely important uh, to develop the source separation um, and uh, to uh, support uh, waste management to, to other ways. Next slide. And uh, our approach to develop the social separation, uh, again, not uh, the only way to do it, but that uh, our specific way that uh, how the state uh, government have con communicated with the municipalities and the municipalities have not been perhaps uh, always very active uh, to, uh, to act in that field. Uh, there, there is a um, uh, regulation from uh, Minister of the Environment, which is uh, really describing uh, in rather detailed way uh, which waste streams or material streams the municipalities have to organize uh, uh, um, source separation for which uh, that doesn't mean ex this um, um, this uh, ordinance at least does not say that which exact uh, waste types should be collected on the property which on the public uh, room somewhere on the streets and which on the 
uh, way stations. So it is left to the municipalities uh, to decide. And of course, here is also that uh, there is a certain list which is uh, like a compulsory list mandatory list and uh, some uh, there mentioned are are like uh, voluntary and at the beginning in the 2007 uh, the park waste from the bio waste was uh, uh, obligatory to organize the collection and the kitchen waste was not and uh, later it was amended 2015 and uh, also the kitchen waste um, uh, separate collection is made obligatory uh, to the municipalities next slide Uh, and uh, uh, how the uh, prices or the fees are set is, um, as I said, that this is a tender. And uh, on the tender today, the service providers are offering uh, the price. And uh, usually in, in most of the municipalities today, it goes even, that might be different really from the many countries. Uh, the, the fees are not even uh, uh, go through the municipalities. That means that most of the households, they pay directly uh, to the waste service provider. Uh, and um, that have been debated and still debated that, uh, and I see also, I, I, I really support that uh, the, there is definitely more uh, benefits uh, in a model where the fees are collected by a municipality. And um, to say simply why, uh, there are a couple of things. One thing is uh, that some people who are not paying the fees, so this is often, not, all, not all, always only, but, but often the people with the social problems, kind of. And uh, this is always easier if the municipality is dealing with these people instead of the private company. And the second thing is that uh, this is for the future, is that if we uh, want to have uh, uh, rapid developments in the source separation, and that definitely means also some differentiation of the service prices. And uh, there, if, the, if the, all the service fees uh, go through the municipality, then the municipalities have much better uh, options to uh, differentiate those uh, fees uh, uh, by local conditions and to make exemptions if needed and whatever actually, to be flexible. The uh, private companies usually on those issues are not uh, necessarily flexible or, or uh, vice versa could be also that they're putting a very high price uh, to the mixed waste so that uh, it could cause uh, other problems uh, where the, wherever the waste wa uh, mixed waste then is delivered. Uh, but this is the, the situation uh, in our case, yes, that uh, everything by a tender and, and fixed prices then. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, the, um, the public containers that we see, uh, as I said, that mostly for the uh, packaging and the clothing. And of course, uh, the other picture shows that I think that this is also in your country, in winter period, sometimes it is problematic. So somebody have to take also this issue um, into account that uh, how to uh, how to assure that uh, the waste could be collected around the year. Uh, but uh, let's take next slide here. So uh, now the municipal waste and obviously about uh, the treatment. Yeah? Um, um, and uh, of course, the one uh, big issue is that um, um, the wa waste are easier. This has been the tradition to uh, to just to deliver the landfill. And uh, now the question is um, that uh, this is in long run not acceptable. That uh, uh, Harry Moore already referred that there is uh, currently, of course, this is not uh, yet uh, very soon, but 2020. Uh, Third, uh, 35, there is expected that not more than 10 years. Of course, there is said that uh, uh, there could be um, agreed uh, special terms uh, to some countries where uh, the initial level have been uh, very high. So that is not exactly that even if uh, Bosnia would join that this 10% would uh, imply. But, but anyway, this is a certain target, so to say. And uh, to reduce, and uh, uh, even without that, what is important to emphasize, and this is basic requirement um, in the 99 landfill directive. This is reduction of the biodegradable waste. There, of course, was referred to as a benchmark of the level of the you know, landfilling in 1995. So it's very old time already. But, but anyway, there is a gradius um, 
gradual uh, reduction is required. And so that means that um, uh, whether to do it through the source operation of the bio waste out, so that is definitely preferable, but uh, there are other options uh, to reduce both the bio waste uh, and uh, general landfilling. And then we uh, will uh, see, come to the issue of the, of the after treatment of the mixed municipal waste. And there are two options, MBT and insulation. And in our case, the insulation in 2002 waste management plan was uh, discussed, evaluated, but considered too expensive because the evaluation was, and I think that's still, uh, of course, correct, um, is uh, roughly 50 million euro per 100 uh, uh, million. Um, uh, 100,000 ton uh, uh, per year um, capacity. So it means that we have uh, 200 plus uh, tons uh, uh, facility uh, insulator and the cost was 100 uh, million. And, uh, but that was, as I already uh, just uh, explained and just referring back to it, that the landfill tax raise was perhaps this key that the load to do those investments even without the special investment support. Even that means that um, to say that uh, we should not always really um, uh, be so much um, in today's uh, type of situation, but there should be definitely uh, hope. And, and that after five years, after 10 years, there is absolutely not absolutely, but quite different situation. Let's next slide. And this is just a comparison that uh, was brought in Estonia and, and uh, might be not correct for your country, but the oil shale we already mentioned here. And that is funny thing that um, such an average um, uh, mixed municipal waste, uh, they have uh, a averagely equal uh, calorific value. And if we many years, of course, uh, we landfill something 300, 400,000 ton of uh, mixed municipal waste. So that was quite a lot of energy, of course. But that is also true. And this is uh, very pretty often asked that if in most cases, uh, any power station or whatever energy producer, they are paying for the fuel. So fuel has also positive price. Uh, then for the waste, this is vice versa. Waste has a negative price. And then uh, many people don't understand why. Uh, but the, the explanation, or the basic explanation, is that when it comes to the waste uh, insulation, producing energy out of waste, this is much more um, incentive um, investments. Uh, uh, needing uh, process and those investments should be covered also and that, that makes um, not possible really although there are in some countries uh, also in Denmark I think they say that it could be done uh, with a relatively low price but in most countries in Europe I mean um, insulation prices are something like um, starting from 60 euro per ton perhaps uh, in, in our country, uh, when the insulation started 2013, then the initial gate fee was something around 30 euro per ton. There was no tax, as I said. Next slide. Uh, and this is just a picture from the, from the insulation. Um, uh, yeah, it is serious. Um, industrial insulation, uh, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but what is positive of it is that uh, um, you get read from the bio waste, uh, there is no leachate issue and as such in the landfills, there is no landfill gas issue and the landfills after that actually, uh, and so on. And uh, yeah, next slide, let's take next slide. Uh, and the one is what is in some countries at least concerns about um, air emissions. And um, here is just to say that yes, indeed, if uh, the rules are not uh, followed, uh, set for the waste insulation, then it's uh, rather harmful, could be. But the rules are very strict. And indeed, uh, if the rules are fulfilled or followed, then the waste insulation is not uh, really a harming uh, environment in no way. In Sweden, I have been in uh, one of the uh, new uh, installations where it was uh, owned by a municipality and of course they monitored the um, uh, exhaust gases on the um, on the pipe or, uh, or the chimney of the uh, waste generation and they also monitored the air quality on the streets and they said that um, on the rush hour uh, the air quality on the streets uh, was uh, worse than uh, the exhaust gases uh, really going to the atmosphere from the waste insulation. So this is just a comparison. Uh, next slide. 
And of course, when it is uh, the waste incineration, you have to face uh, just uh, new uh, waste types. Uh, you're going to have um, um, two types of ashes, so-called fly ash, and you have a bottom ash. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that is perhaps uh, um, positive side. It's not that big, but anyway, something like three to four percent from the input material uh, is possible uh, to uh, take out as uh, metals. And of course, those metals uh, are going to the recycling. Then they are counted also towards the municipal waste uh, recycling. So there is a tiny, not very essential, but tiny uh, support to the to the recycling also from the. And this is uh, in line with the uh, EU rules today, because there is another uh, kind of uh, discussion being that whether if this bottom uh, uh, ash or, or something, the, um, yeah, bottom ash, first of all, perhaps could be theoretically at least put to the concrete and uh, considered as um, construction materials, hence uh, recycled material. So this is today not accepted uh, on those calculations, at least, uh, but uh, metals are. So next slide. Uh, and the uh, bottom ash is uh, after the treatment, so called aging um, and removing uh, metals and so on and so on. So, in our case, this is used uh, in landscaping of the uh, landfill, the big landfill, the new landfill actually near the Tallinn. So, they are itself using that, that material. Um, and this is considered recovery. Um, and therefore, as a landfill tax is only for the disposal, for this uh, use of, uh, of the bottom ash, there is no landfill tax so far. Next slide. Um, and uh, yeah, well, as I said, that um, uh, this is um, uh, the MBT, uh, the mechanical biological treatment, is uh, from the investment point of view, this is definitely a simpler option, clearly. Uh, but uh, what is the other side is that um, uh, what is the aim of the MBT usually is that you separate the high calorific part, the plastic. Uh, perhaps textiles, uh, rubber, such materials. And uh, it has really sense if you have receiver for this uh, particular materials. Uh, this is typically called RDF, refused right fuel. And uh, in most of countries where this is uh, produced, uh, the cement industry is the receiver. So it means that uh, this MBT requires, mostly requires really, uh, very good cooperation with the cement industry. Uh, but to produce the um, RDF uh, without really knowing where to put it uh, is really questionable. And second uh, part of it is that uh, in such a simplified way, uh, actually you crush and sieve, uh, you get this fine fraction. Fine fraction is um, bio waste contained in the mixed municipal waste is usually glass colors. There are some plastics in, there are some hazardous waste contained in the mixed municipal waste in, so it's, it's a mixture. And this is a rather difficult uh, uh, waste stream uh, uh, because uh, um, well, usually it needs aerobic treatment uh, to put to the landfill. In some uh, modes, also in Estonia, by the way, it has been used also for the cover of the landfills in some. Uh, and uh, in our case, and in Northern Europe, uh, there have been definitely not uh, accepted uh, the proposal that it could be used in a more wider uh, way in, in some wider landscaping in the construction uh, of uh, roads or whatever, actually, the road sites. But in some other countries in Southern Europe, in Greece, I think so, in Portugal, uh, yeah, well, they, they have on a national level, they have accepted that this material is used, in, as, as I just um, uh, said. But what is uh, also clear that um, uh, with the new directive uh, amendments in 2018, uh, even if uh, you would take this MBT fine fraction, which contains the bio waste also in big part, definitely. And you could say that this is something like low quality compost and you could use it in landscaping, for example, then uh, this could not be counted towards the recycling of the municipal waste. Uh, and this is uh, said because in some countries, this have been counted towards the uh, targets of the uh, municipal waste recycling so far. So this is for the future. So this is just to describe that, yes, it is cheaper, but there are certain problems associated, definitely. Next slide. And so this was uh, very simple, really. Uh, you can't go simpler even, I would say. Uh, on uh, on MBT in Estonia, it worked some years, doesn't work anymore, but it was like open row. Uh, it was uh, crushed 
and uh, just the um, scheme or the picture on the top there it shows that there was used uh, such a very uh, from the Germany um, system of the of the pipes or metal metal uh, type of um, um, products uh, which um, uh, allowed to uh, rate it without uh, any um, uh, artificial uh, artificial uh, um, um, aeration uh, and uh, that means that the bio waste contained there really degraded uh, in big part and also the um, uh, moisture really evaporated so it was finally it was like a rather dry material that was easier to uh, see later to separate this uh, plastics actually next slide and uh, yeah, that was now in uh, in a couple of cases. So we have those MBT or those uh, RDF producing um, um, uh, facilities today, but uh, uh, they they face this problem that uh, our only uh, cement factory was uh, closed, and there is practically nowhere to deliver it. So that's the problem. Uh, uh, and uh, usually, if they are really this MBT type of sort. Uh, is that you can get out uh, 40 to 50 percent RDF uh, from the uh, from the input material of this mixed municipal waste and something um, 40 percent perhaps uh, then it comes to this fine fraction but I already explain what it is and what the problems are and then the, usually there is uh, some uh, true through the moisture uh, this is evaporating and you you will get the weight loss some 10 to 20 percent so that's the uh, conclusion or, or summary. Next slide. And yeah, this is about the cement uh, facility that RDF means good cooperation with the cement uh, industry. That's absolutely clear. Next slide. Uh, and now to uh, say that uh, whether one is clearly better than another or could only one of them be implemented that first, uh, um, yeah, well, in, without no problem uh, uh, could be implemented uh, on the same time in all country, no, no big problem. Also, even in a small country like Estonia, we have had them both. And uh, this is not a problem. Insuration, definitely insurator, so to say. So this is, uh, uh, I said, a big investment. So there is a big issue that who could be capable uh, making those investments. And second thing is definitely the uh, heating energy. Insurator uh, has this problem that uh, if you don't have uh, the central heating system, which could really uh, take this um, heat, then uh, economically it would be very, very difficult, even perhaps possible to, uh, to install it. So that's, that's for sure. But uh, uh, to compare and to say that one is better on the sense of the recycling, uh, that one uh, of those will uh, give uh, more for the recycling, there is no reason. Both can separate metals usually. And uh, in both cases, metals could be calculated towards the recycling, but that's more almost all. As I said, that this fine fraction for the MB MBT, uh, at least uh, in after a couple of years, could not be any more calculated towards the recycling targets. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is, uh, I think so, what I also said that, uh, yeah, the, the certain discussion have been, but this is today not uh, very practical anymore, that uh, if the RDF goes to the cement factory, there is usually some mineral part in, and this mineral part comes a part of the cement, and that the discussions have been that whether this could also be calculated towards the recycling, but I think that the latest um, interpretation on this field from European Commission say that no, we, we want to keep this uh, uh, simple and and not not even uh, yep and um, let's take next slide let's go further we have uh, peter one. just to let you know uh, we are way out of time yeah that, therefore um, i'm just uh, showing here that uh, our case was that how the landfilling came down from uh, 85 to even up to the 10 percent uh, so it is okay, it was let's say 13 years, 15 years, but just to show that it is really possible, although in 2002 uh, waste management plan uh, that was considered like a little bit too expensive, not possible and so on and so on. So I would like just to bring this example as to encourage that uh, the things are sometimes going faster than you can really expect and uh, don't lose <laughs> faith in this. Uh, it is possible to get out from the landfilling system. And uh, well, this is just right now here. I stop it then because the time is over. Thank you.
Hvala gospodinu Peteru. Thank you, Mr. Peter. I think this presentation was very interesting. And although he uh, have time to finish everything, you have it in your chat window. You have the link that can take you to the presentation. There's been a lot of questions about some issues, some, uh, some things mentioned in the presentation, and we will try to answer them uh, in question and answer. I will ask Mr. Harry now uh, to see whether he wants to continue. I know that he only has three slides or maybe to explain them in the discussion or maybe to give, to have the final word about the materials presented today. So as I understand, I have a chance to wrap up uh, our uh, presentations, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, all I would like to add, I already recognize that there are some questions concerning the incineration because I understand that uh, you, there is also a plan to, to build maybe uh, or invest into the municipal waste incineration. And, and from that point of view, the, uh, the figures Peter showed in the last slide are very, very good. You know, actually, this is mainly thanks to the incineration plant that, we, that the landfilling dropped below 10%. And there's uh, definitely, although Peter was politically uh, maybe correct, not wanting to say what is better, the other one or the, the one or the other one, especially when it comes to incineration and MBT. But I would say, especially in bigger uh, cities such as Sarajevo or something like that, where you have really a, 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 a very wide or very, let's say, the central heating system is there. So that, then, then definitely when attaching the incinerator to already in existing uh, power plant, uh, the costs of investments are low and economically, most probably, this is also quite a uh, reasonable investment. And uh, this is definitely an approach which allows you to cut down the landfilling. But there has been lots of discussion also in Estonia you know, whether the incineration has uh, somehow uh, been negative for recycling, then the only thing that you have to really plan in the country is that not to invest or in, let's say, to build too much of capacity, either both in, in, uh, in, in incineration and MPT. Plus, if you have also cheap landfilling, then if you have overcapacity, then even uh, then there is no way that you can go for uh, for uh, more recycling. So in Estonia, we had also a slight problem because uh, these investments were made in parallel, as, as Peter said, by kind of private companies, although one of them is, is state-owned, still this was their own investment, uh, I mean, incinerator and several MPT lines. And the capacity almost exceeded the amount of uh, municipal waste what uh, was produced at that time. Good thing is that uh, the MBTs are now out of the uh, business and they are basically, basically not anymore functioning. And at the moment, the capacity for incineration is, is fine. So this is important that you really, on your regional and national level, you should really make a careful planning not to build too much of landfills, but also too, not too much capacity for, for uh, incineration on MBT. So basically, you already know that you have to uh, recycle minimum 50% of your uh, municipal waste. That this means that you can't exceed the 50% uh, capacity, uh, which is covered by landfills and uh, incinerators and other means of, for mixed municipal waste. So don't, don't uh, over-invest, uh, otherwise you will have a lock-in and uh, it's very difficult to get out of that. But just uh, very briefly to wrap up, there are a few slides at the end of Peter's uh, presentation. Uh, they are basically just stressing what Peter has already said, that uh, it's very important to set up the legal framework, first of all. Uh, yeah, if you go on, then you see the, 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 the kind of scheme, uh, which, uh, which tries to say, yes, this was the one. Uh, that the legal framework is important and this is, but it's not the only uh, task you have to do. And I also a little bit see that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, your main uh, kind of effort has gone into the uh, transposition of, of the legal framework. Uh, as Peter already told, and it's clear, 
legal part to, to take over the EU uh, waste legislation, it's very easy exercise. The, it, it becomes very more, much more difficult when it comes to the implementation. So therefore you should, in addition to development of legal framework, very clearly define the roles and responsibilities. And here I would say the key role is when it comes to municipal waste on, uh, on municipalities. And as you heard in Estonia, we made slight uh, mistake by not putting too much uh, efforts on municipalities and really too much going for privatization. There has to be an optimum. Of course, private sector has to be there, but the key role has to remain uh, and responsibility has to remain on, on municipalities. And uh, of course, the other part, which is very important, this is uh, adequate uh, financing mechanism. It's very, very important without uh, really designing a, a system on how to finance the system, starting from taxes. And here I would say the Estonian positive example is this landfill tax. I would really recommend to think on that, on your case also. Uh, gradually increasing landfill tax has to be there if you want to achieve very quick uh, changes. And this is also the source for, for, for uh, new uh, investments into the recycling and other more modern waste management uh, infrastructure uh, development. So this is important. And then also taxes for packaging. I would say this is important together with EPR system, which means that the other very important role is covered by the producers. So, and what Peter also tried to say, maybe not so clearly, try to establish the extended producer system in a way or pack it with legislation so that it is not really uh, let's say, occupied or taken by waste management companies again. So it has to be under the control of, of producers. So you have to develop the system in a way that producers really take the responsibility, that they control the system, the organization itself, and that they have a motivation to organize and set up a transparent system. And I would say Estonian experience also shows that the uh, deposit system is something you should also consider because this is extremely uh, efficient, uh, transparent system to really achieve certain targets which are already there. Without the uh, deposit system, it's impossible. But when it comes to the deposit system, it's extremely important that this EPR organization is again under the control of producers, not some sort of uh, system which is a kind of useful tool for some businesses or waste management companies who know who, who knows who. This is the main thing I would like to stress here. Uh, of course, uh, the third pillar is this public awareness part, which is the basis anyway. But I would say uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, adequate uh, financing mechanism backed with strong legislation. And uh, uh, of course, uh, awareness raising in parallel, this is the key. And this is something you have to really take into account when developing your system in, in your country. For the, with this, I think I will uh, close my mouth. Uh, we have uh, only, I think, some minutes left for questions and answers, but let's let's take them as much as possible. Uh, uh, we are ready to take more time if needed, but uh, yeah, please. Thank you. I will continue in uh, our language. Uh, indeed, we received a lot of questions, nearly 30 questions. Uh, on uh, in our q a box uh, we tried to group some of them into nine topics so whatever we fail to answer i discussed this with drajenko we will uh, try to provide written answers uh, and uh, we will ask you to provide written answers we want to make sure that all uh, questions are answered. I will start with the deposit system. I think that was one of the first questions. Several participants asked different questions uh, in relation to this system, which is rather interesting for Bosnia and Herzegovina, as you also mentioned. And the question was, to which extent is the coverage uh, well, uh, uh, to which extent was the coverage of uh, waste collection developed before introducing the deposit system? For what type of uh, this, uh, the uh, packaging uh, waste uh, 
the system was more developed uh, and uh, what was the, the contribution of the state in the whole procedure? Do you think, to which extent do you believe the deposit system is successful? Hrvats Croatia is uh, recycling 25%, uh, Slovenia 50% while they don't have the deposit system. They th There is another participant who said that uh, they have deposit system for packaging waste, but uh, their balance is minus. So what is uh, the coverage uh, uh, with the waste collection system? what kind of uh, waste was collected uh, mostly in this way and uh, what is the level of success uh, compared to the countries which don't have this de deposit system in place and they give perhaps uh, harry could answer this question or peter whatever i think we missed something uh... Yeah, there were some questions or what was them um, because there were no uh, translation uh okay <laughs> so the questions were related to the deposit system um uh, what was the level of uh, 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 at the time when the deposit system uh, was uh, introduced in terms of uh, weight collection uh, what type of uh, uh, packaging waste was the uh, mostly collected uh, uh, what were the costs uh, the country has uh, related to establishment of deposit system and uh, what is your opinion how successful this system is comparing to the countries where there is no uh, deposit system in place uh, especially having in mind that in Croatia for example the system is in place but the, um, uh, the country or the the whole system has a big uh, expenses so uh, it's, it's in minus <laughs> in terms of, of, of money. This is the deposit system is maybe a, a separate issue which we can take as a, as a, as a kind of separate uh, uh, kind of workshop or something. But uh, to, to, to be very short, both me and uh, Peter, we were part of this development in the early uh, stages in Estonia. And uh, Estonia was, was one of the first companies outside of the Nordics, plus, of course, Germany, where there was this deposit system has been in, uh, been in the place already many many years so but uh, in Estonia the success was that uh, first of all ministry very clearly introduced it as a mandatory part uh, later on Peter you can a little bit uh, add uh, from your point of view this was very important that uh, the ministry decided that this is important it is uh, introduced on beverage and uh, low alcoholic drinks as Peter already said uh, covering uh, uh, plastic, uh, glass and uh, metal, basically all the materials for, for this type of beverage containers, both one way and uh, reusable ones. It's very important, I would like to stress here, that without deposit system, it's almost impossible to keep the reusable bottles in the system. And in Estonia, in Latvia, Lithuania, neighboring countries uh, were much more later now Lithuania has introduced also deposit system in Latvia is on the way, but just to compare Estonia, the share of re refillable bottles is much higher than in Latvia, Lithuania. And this is thanks to the deposit system. Mm -hmm. And uh, this investment was made by, by producers, mainly um, beverage and uh, low alcohol producers, uh, importers. Uh, there were no cost for, uh, for uh, the government at all. They made the, 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 uh, the investment. And if you keep it well managed and run and under the control of producers, because they make the investments, basically investments related to take back machines and so on. If it's well managed, then uh, Estonia in a certain time, better you can a little bit you know, correct me. It was five years ago. There were almost zero uh, costs for producers. So if we compare the costs for producers uh, comparing the deposit system and the container collection system, then the, the deposit system is cheaper for, uh, for uh, producers. Uh, this is uh, definitely a good argument to say that the uh, deposit system is expensive. This is, this is totally wrong uh, argument, which is usually a little bit like um, uh, uh, presented in a wrong way, especially this is the lobby of uh, container collection system uh, organizations. Uh, so it's not, it's not definitely 
more expensive. And especially when you take into account that the deposit system allows to take back or collect approximately 90% of uh, packaging put on the market. Can you imagine 90%, almost you know, close to 100. At the same time, container system allows to collect back uh, hardly, if you talk about plastics, then uh, definitely below 50%. And even compared to this, uh, this, these figures, even then I would say the the costs are at least in in Estonian case they are lower for for producers. That's why producers are in a way today happier with this system. And uh, of course there were lots of uh, lobbying against of that in the very beginning. But uh, but uh, after that when it was introduced and the real real reality came out, then it turned out that it's cheap. And uh, at the moment uh, producers are are happy. So. Peter, if you want to add something, then... Yes, just some words. Uh, first, uh, uh, the, indeed, that uh, there was no investment from the side of the government, practically. All was invested uh, from the uh, side of the producers. And the very initial investment was roughly 5 million euros. They made the accounting center, so on. And uh, this is uh, important to emphasize in many countries. The question is that, what about those reverse vending machines, those uh, collection uh, machines installed? Uh, they, this is uh, not required even, at least not on the standing phase, it is possible to uh, do it uh, manually. But of course, with the machines, this is better. In our case, those uh, machines, RVMs called, they are invested by um, retail shops, but uh, not only their own cost, because the deposit system is paying for them the handling cost, the take back cost. And principally, this is covering the cost. So this is on one side of the question was that what was the level of collection before the deposit? I think it was so if to put it roughly, it was not higher than 30 percent of the pet bottles and, uh, and metal um, uh, cans. And uh, with the deposit, it uh, went uh, very fast with one year, uh, approximately 80. And now it's uh, close, no, 90, uh, more or less. Uh, that means that that was one of the arguments we really uh, put it uh, towards. It was that, uh, as I said, that uh, the law was uh, adopted 2004 when we came to the European Union and the more or less year later, uh, the deposit system came to the force. And the argument was that we have to achieve uh, the fast changes in the packaging collection. And that was one of the, one of the ways to do it. And uh, the question was about the uh, Croatia, and of course, I'm not exactly the expert, but a year ago in one seminar, there was very good uh, presentation from one Croatian expert, uh, actually the uh, um, professor of the university. And he explained the situation, I can just refer to him, uh, that the problem in Croatia is that actually this is not exactly the extended producer responsibility in that very sense that all the money goes through the state-owned fund. And uh, to put it mildly, uh, there are certain political interests uh, to use those funds in other purposes. And that keeps the service fees uh, for the um, uh, producers uh, higher than it would be in a exactly and rapidly uh, producer uh, produced um, model that is uh, implemented in Estonia. And just to say that Hari also said, that indeed, uh, I think it was three years approximately when there was very good conditions uh, also in the world market uh, on the materials collected. That was that the prices of the materials were high. Uh, then uh, the Estonian deposit system uh, was run with uh, zero fees for the producers, zero fees. Producers didn't pay anything. Uh, of course, they had the cost on labeling and so on, but that's minor anyway. Uh, the service fees were zero, uh, but this is exceptional. You, you, nobody could really take that this is a kind of uh, long-lasting situation, and neither is in Estonia today. There are fees they pay again, but even if to compare those fees they pay, I would say that um, in some uh, uh, materials, uh, those are definitely cheaper than it would be in the container collection. And in some others, there are similar, I mean, on the, uh, and then on the class, it might be uh, slightly higher, but uh, the question is that they are also collecting it more effectively. They are collecting 90%. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, then uh, I will continue in English. Ja ću na engleskom jer očigledno prijevod radi ovaj u jednom smjeru da ne komplikujemo. Uh, I will continue in English, in English asking you questions. Uh, the next one about recycling. Uh, what kind of waste streams are mostly recycled in Estonia? 
Uh, what about hazardous waste? Do you have recovery capacities or you export it? If yes, where? Um, and uh, is Esto Estonia exporting waste? Uh, how is this integrated in the reporting and targets? So yeah. maybe Peter again. Peter, I will take the first one and leave okay. the second, uh, second uh, hazardous yeah. waste to you because, I, of course, we both would like to answer. But uh, in a way, when it comes to the source separation and the recycling, and if we talk about municipal waste, then, uh, as you already understood from the EU perspective, you know, uh, at the moment, uh, of course, it depends on municipalities, uh, the bigger municipalities, and this is uh, also based on this uh, ordinance, what Peter mentioned, that the ministry has established that there are certain list of uh, mandatory uh, waste streams with, that have to be uh, collected. Uh, so, in theory, basically, all municipalities have to collect uh, all these major waste streams, starting, of course, in addition to mixed municipal waste, uh, uh, waste paper, uh, packaging, uh, bio waste, uh, um, and then, of course, uh, this is something which is usually collected uh, door to door. It's uh, in most of the municipalities, or at least in the process, that, that the organized waste management collection or waste collection should cover, in addition to mixed waste, there has to be a container for waste paper, uh, bio waste, and more and more there is a tendency that, uh, then, but it's main, no more, more voluntary that also next to the, the door, next to the houses, there is packaging going at the container. But the, as Peter said, the packaging is usually collected uh, via public, uh, public containers. So this is the main set which, uh, which uh, is under the, which is there in most of the municipalities, but still. It has to be improved and especially enforced what that we see at the moment that not all municipalities uh, would like to deal with that. So they, they try to do it as minimum as, as possible. And then there are certain different, different uh, exemption, ex, ex, exemptions or exam, uh, they, they have exempted, let's say, individual houses or, or some other houses. So it is still under the development, but this is the thumb of the rule that, that in the future, in addition uh, to uh, mixed waste, paper waste, bio waste next to the door, and packaging. This is the minimum part. And Peter, you can take this uh, the problem of, of uh, uh, hazardous waste because Estonia is small, and this is maybe, I, I have also, as I understand, this is also a problem in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, what to do maybe. with specific waste streams. Yeah, but there was uh, also a question concerning the recycling capacities. And I would say that this is also uh, problematic for the smaller or medium even countries to recycle all of. And we do not have practically any metallurgical uh, industry. So metals are 100%. Uh, glass is, I mean, uh, half to half. Half is uh, recycled locally, half is uh, um, exported. Paper also, some perhaps 20 is locally recycled, 80% is delivered to the other countries. Uh, plastics are really very changing. and. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, some uh, less than half is recycled in Estonia, more is, uh, is exported. Um, uh, usually uh, today, of course, today countries, neighboring countries here, more or less. And this is, is very changing, as you may know that, of course, not so much, but anyway, uh, until 2018, also from Estonia, something was delivered to the China. And China is not receiving anything anymore uh, like this. So this is a problem, whether uh, there are deliveries to the other Asian countries uh, and now in the EU, it should be solved. So basically this is the, and the second question was about the hazardous waste. And the hazardous waste indeed, this is a very um, um, mixture of different waste streams, starting for example, the batteries and the uh, waste electronics, uh, those are also. And the batteries are not treated in Estonia, except the late uh, eighth batteries. Uh, we have a facility definitely. And they are bringing in pretty much of, uh, uh, of uh, lead uh, AC batteries from other countries, but but uh, other smaller batteries of whatever types of those are exported. Uh, we is treated partly in Estonia, partly exported to the other countries. Uh, some recyclers in Estonia take the we from the other countries, so it's uh, rather such a changing. But uh, the more other uh, waste, which is perhaps the, the usual understanding, that means that the, some home chemicals and paints and solvents and whatever such stuff is is collected. Uh, there are hazardous waste companies. This is a very well established for today, uh, private companies, network, dealing, offering services and collection and everything. And then uh, what is burnable is burned. 
uh, there is one, uh, as I said, that it was earlier, it was uh, sent to the cement uh, kiln also pretty much of today, this is a part of the problem, but still we have one private company in Tartu, they are incinerating some 2000 tons, I think so. Uh, there is one very delicate uh, hazardous waste type is medical waste coming from the hospitals, uh, containing the human tissues or something. So this is also, uh, let's say, incinerated in this special incinerator. Uh, and if something needs to be finally landfilled, uh, then there is also specially designated hazardous waste landfill. There is treatment options, the physical chemical treatment, but this needs to be solidified uh, uh, to the firm uh, type of concrete like. This is not exactly the concrete, but concrete like uh, uh, model. Um, and then it will, will be landfilled. But uh, if needed, and that, that happens definitely, then uh, is also exported to the other countries. In our case, it's usually Finland, Sweden, Germany, perhaps such countries. Maybe just to add better, uh, uh, but in the very beginning, states still invested into the first capacity for hazardous waste treatment. This, the first major investments were made by, by the state, and then later on they were rented to private companies, and now private companies are more and more investing themselves, right? Yeah. This is more yeah. like... That's, that's right. Look, the the, the very, very basic network was first like established by a state, this is true, but later on it have been even privatized, uh, several of those uh, collection centers. It's more like in private hands today. Uh, and this is what I said that we are really using, if needed, uh, the services provided by Finland, Sweden, Germany. So it has been all the time. For example, such a very, very serious issue. And um, I don't know whether it has been so in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that is the old pesticides. Because uh, as we regained our independence in 1991, there we had also this collective farm system in Estonia, and every collective farm had some uh, storages of the old pesticides. And in the end of 90s, it all was uh, first mapped and uh, registered and then cleaned up those sites. And there was roughly 600, 700 tons of uh, old pesticides. And most of them were also finally uh, sent to Finland and. Uh, and uh, Germany, I think so, for the um, treatment iteration mostly. And some remained in Estonia, for example, the mercury containing waste, because no insulator, even a designated hazardous waste insulator, they don't really accept anything that contains in a higher concentrations mercury. So that remained in Estonia, that was solidified and put to the specially designated hazardous waste landfill. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, more questions. Of course, uh, we will extend a little bit of seminar for 10 minutes if everybody agrees. Uh, the next uh, set of questions is regarded to uh, cost of services. Basically, the question was, uh, what is the price of landfilling uh, now in Estonia? I think there was in one of your slides about up to 70 euros. Yep. Uh, did, you, uh, did you gradually increase this price uh, and uh, how this impacted the price for the citizens' uh, collection and, uh, and disposal of, of that the citizens paid? How, how this impacted uh, the this, this the tariff, actually. Yeah, very good question. Uh, actually, as I also, indeed, it was in my slides that uh, in 2001, it was not more than 10%, then somewhere in the mid 2000s, uh, 2010, then it was some 40, uh, 30, 40 euro, and now it is some 70 to 90, roughly. And the uh, state have not really influenced those uh, prices. The landfills itself have uh, come to this. Uh, the influence to the, um, to the service prices to the households, uh, it have uh, been, of course, but not very, uh, I would say, um, essential because uh, there are other components, uh, uh, the cost component, definitely the transport collection and so on. But uh, average, if you put it in average, I think that average is something around five euro per household per month. Uh, but in uh, in many cases, especially the families living in their own family houses, uh, and uh, they are sorting out usually the bio waste and composting in a garden, and and if the people are sorting out the packages and uh, delivering them to the packaging container, it means that they have very few uh, also um, mixed municipal waste. I think in many places uh, the the average monthly uh, fee could be only two three euros per per month. Okay, thank and, you and very much. Funny, 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 just to amend is that 
uh, funny thing is that um, uh, very often today also politicians uh, in the parliament even if there is discussion about why uh, the development on the source separation and uh, on the recycling but hurry also uh, covered up uh, why, why where is the problem and why and and uh, pretty often is uh, put the finger on that uh, actually the fees uh, the households pay for the mixed municipal waste they're too low that this service is so cheap that the people don't feel themselves motivated to change their behavior, to uh, to sort out more actually. And, and therefore many people suggest that we have to do something to make namely, not the waste management as total, but namely the mixed municipal waste more expensive. Yeah, this is, this is maybe a little bit the political issue because as the Estonian experience shows, and as Peter mentioned, I would say for, if you live in a big house with many uh, flats, then it average fee uh, per per flat is something uh, I would say not more than two two euros per month, which is basically one cup of uh, coffee, you know. And uh, but at the same time, this is very heated discussion on local level, especially before elections or something like that. Somehow people tend to take this as a very significant uh, uh, sum, uh, and there's a lots of uh, discussion, debate, and politicians are afraid to increase this fee. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why our uh, municipal waste management system is in a way stuck because nobody is willing to increase this fee, although it's very low. And we, we have made several examples by showing that the total communal uh, cost for one land, uh, one household is could be several hundred euros, including energy, heating and everything. So the waste part of this communal cost is uh, below 5%. So it's ridiculously low compared to the other communal costs. And uh, But at the same time, on the political level, it's always an issue. Always local politicians tend to bring it up, up as, as a problem, so to say. But I would say that this is not really very high at the moment. It has to be increased definitely in the future. OK, thank you very much. Uh, the next set of questions is related to landfill closure. Um, the question was uh, how much time uh, and money you needed to close all unsanitary or uncontrolled uh, uh, municipal landfill, uh, and did you actually close all of them in Estonia? Um, do, uh, does the landfills that are closed have uh, uh, already uh, fin uh, uh, have secured financial guarantees and uh, supervision uh, for the next 30 years? Um, and how did you actually uh, prevent uh, to uh, prevent the people to create uh, dumping sites uh, uh, in situation when you started applying this landfilling tax? Uh, uh, and uh, whether there were some uh, um, uh, negative feeling from the from the municipal side when this landfill tax and closure of municipal uh, landfill was taking uh, place. So uh, these are a couple of questions related yeah, to the closure. And if you can, you know, just shortly answer them, please, because uh, we have to wrap up in yeah. a couple of minutes. Well, I right. it for Peter then, because he's very short, I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, the period was obviously some 15 years or even more when we started. We started in the end of the 90s yet. And it uh, went up to 2015 when all those old landfills were uh, closed and covered. Uh, now about this financial guarantee, of course, on all those old landfills, uh, which uh, worked uh, once and didn't collect anything for the future um, aftercare fund, uh, there was no such thing. And uh, if they are closed, uh, then there are set by environmental administration uh, certain rules for the monitoring, for example. But uh, those costs are then uh, to the municipality. Uh, who really was the owner of the landfill. So this is the basic approach. Of course, in the new landfills and now operating uh, currently, they all are uh, obliged to collect uh, certain funds separately for the final uh, closure and aftercare until 30 years. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will last 30 years, but up to 30 years if the monitoring shows that it is necessary. So this is different. Uh, now the question, and that is very, very justified, that was exactly a uh, lot of uh, opinions on level of the average citizens mm -hmm. on the level of the local politicians that it is not a very wise uh, option at all to close the old landfills and, and so on and so on. 
And uh, in my slides, there was, I will just refer to them that uh, from the very beginning, the basic approach was that uh, uh, the all households, as much as possible, at least, at least, uh, say, should be joined to the compulsory waste collection system. That the model that was really practiced uh, before, that especially in the countries, uh, but even in the small towns and so on and so on, and especially the people living in the own family houses, that they just deliver their waste itself to the local dumping site. So this is not any more acceptable. And if, and many of them, and many of them say that I don't need, we don't need here the waste collection service. We do not even generate the waste actually so this is just a fairy tale and should not be taken uh, seriously and uh, just there is a rule that all households where the people are living uh, there should stand a waste container which is emptied let's say once per uh, month and uh, the uh, the owner of the property or the house uh, has to pay this bill. Would it be two euro or three euro or whatever, actually? So this is to make clear for the people that this is a service. And this is, uh, if somebody would like or does not like, this is compulsory service. And you are expected to put uh, waste into the container. And even if you are not doing, you are still charged. Yeah. So this is the basic approach to type of uh, to make clear that uh, no, you are generating the waste. Everybody is generating the waste, and uh, we collect it. And we, I mean, as a society, as a municipality, as a state, we do not accept that you are dealing with your waste itself because in most cases this is uh, uh, not in line with the requirements of the law. So, the, uh, but the, the um, um, landfill tax influence in that very sense. It haven't really um, influenced um, uh, the prices, the service prices that the average families pay uh, so rapidly. So um, practically, there's no reason to say that there was like a clear um, type of um, behavior or a change in the people that now you raise the landfill tax, now we're gonna not more pay and they're gonna really deliver the waste to the, to the pushes actually. Uh, well, that is perhaps the summary. Okay. Yeah, just just few few clarifications. Yes, the key was that uh, municipalities were forced to form a, a register of local uh, property owners, mm -hmm. and they automatically were then uh, linked to the uh, service. <laughs> so even in the very beginning, some of them they said, "No, we are we are not going to put any container out there because you know we don't care about this service." But then they started to get bills and then they recognized that there's no sense. And they, of course, in the very beginning, took them to the courts and were lots of hassle. But then they understood that it's easier to pay the bill and put the container. And then it took away the motivation to take this waste into the, you know, littering somewhere just to tamp it somewhere. This was the key. And uh, it took some years uh, to introduce it. But after that, it started to work at least the minimum uh, one container for mixed municipal waste then this pressure for uh, littering and dumping was taken away. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are a lot of questions regarding the incineration, especially because Canton Sarajevo is examining the possibility of procuring the cogeneration plant. Uh, maybe I will just ask uh, two questions and then I will uh, finalize this uh, Q&A session and ask you to, if possible, to provide answers in written for the rest of the questions. And Drajenko is also having something to ask and uh, uh, to, to wrap up. So regarding the, the, the incineration, the question was, uh, uh, what were recycling and landfilling rates in Estonia before introdu introduction of incineration and uh, how these uh, rates changed to date? Uh, I think these answers are on the slides, but if you can just in short. And um, since uh, EU for recycling is uh, expecting the stricter targets, what is the future of incineration in Estonia? What, what are the, the perspectives? And if you are in position to decide on incineration today, having in mind the EU Green Deal and uh, other legal, uh, I mean, European policies, would you still take the same course? Uh, yeah. What are the biggest challenges with incineration? The administrative part or financial, or logistical, and social. Uh, someone is asking also about the treatment per ton, price per ton. I think there is also in the slides. So if if you can just briefly, you know, what is the future in the perspective of, uh, of future of incineration in the perspective of EU, and uh, what are the challenges? I will take very quickly first, and Peter could maybe they add a few few words. Uh, uh, as Peter showed in his slide. The, after the incinerator was introduced, uh, the landfilling dropped in two years from 70% below 
this is already something just to you know understand what was the influence of the incinerate incineration and for, compared to that we were very successful uh, regarding the uh, landfill uh, the targets uh, when it comes to the next steps then uh, as i already already said there was a slight fear that we have too much of capacity when it comes to incineration plus mbt but as 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 already peter mentioned mbt is out of the business because of of economic costs simply operational cost and there, there is no place to, to take this uh, RDF. So basically they are in a way out. And uh, at the moment, uh, the capacity of incineration fits very well to the big picture because it, it, they can't incinerate more than 50% of municipal waste. So the other 50% has to be recycled. But uh, uh, from the, let's say 10, 10 year perspective, I think they have counted uh, easily. There will be no be major changes. And if we look on what other more developed countries they do, like Sweden or other countries, they still keep the incineration. And it is clear that there is still need for incineration because incineration has an alternative, very strong alternative for, for landfilling. But again, it can't be increased. So there will be no additional investments. And uh, most probably EU doesn't accept any public, let's say, support money, which will go to the ways to uh, heat or let's say incinerate incinerators so EU doesn't like this anymore so most probably this will be limited limited mm -hmm. and I would just add there was uh, I saw also like comment that uh, European uh, Environmental Bureau I think so have commented that this is not environmental and so on and uh, there are definitely different political opinions but I would refer the European Commission issued a year or two uh, their communication uh, concerning especially the waste incineration, and uh, the idea in this communication was that uh, uh, the um, uh, waste incineration is fully in line with the EU waste policy, but the question is uh, how much. And in many cases, indeed, the European Commission have uh, even criticized the countries that are incinerating too much. That means that um, uh, there was, I think, in Harry's slides that um, there is today the target for 2035, 65% of the municipal waste should be recycled, two thirds. That means that still is absolutely acceptable. And I think that this comes close to the uh, level where it's unavoidable already. One third of the total municipal waste should be treated in some other way. You can't really, that is only a pink dream. Somebody's dream that uh, we're gonna reach, uh, I mean, near 100% of recycling. It's, it's simply not possible. And then this one third, in long term is absolutely acceptable uh, to incinerate and uh, even in some materials for example take a paper or take some plastics uh, where uh, this um, uh, mechanical recycling uh, could not really uh, be held up uh, uh, too many rounds it's a rather limited number and therefore it's absolutely unavoidable even that part of the low quality paper and uh, low quality plastics are really removed from the circulation and what you can do with them if you uh, will really have to remove them uh, to keep up the quality of the other, other stream. So therefore, I, I, I'm not saying that the incineration is the best thing in the world, but uh, I really agree fully what the European Commission have said in this communication that is fully in line with EU waste uh, policy. And it is absolutely without any doubts preferable to the landfilling. So this is important to emphasize. Because very often it is, I really see it, that, that those who are opposing uh, um, really iteration, they are not like agreeing that uh, that means actually that you say that uh, even if those wastes are going to the landfills, so this is more acceptable. Thank you, Peter, very much. Uh, uh, I want to say, I want to say, I want to say, I apologize to all the participants for. Uh, leaving some of the answer, uh, questions unanswered, but we will ask definitely our experts to provide uh, written uh, responses, and uh, these would be made available to you. Now I give the floor to Draženko. He also wanted to ask a couple of questions, and then I will close uh, this meeting. Before we close the webinar, I have uh, two questions, and they are uh, related to the title of this uh, webinar. How did the responsible bodies of Estonia act uh, in the situation when they were transposing the EU legislation in the national 
legislation observed that the economic infrastructure did not enable full implementation of EU requirements in practice. A practical example, we have transposed legislation, but it's not being implemented in practice. We have laws and bylaws, but municipalities and cities who are actually in charge of organizing the waste uh, system, management system are not implementing them in practice. That's my first question. The second question is, you mentioned uh, cost of collection. This cost of three to five euros for households for waste collection, does it include everything? Collection, transport and landfilling or taking care of it, landfilling or whatever? So is everything included in this cost of five euros per household? I hope you did you hear the questions? Did you listen to the translation? Uh, the, the translation system doesn't work very well because I think we have to have <laughs> Okay, so quickly, I'll, I'll we, just rely, we, we have to rely on you. Uh, once you tra transpose the directives, uh, what were the challenges? I mean, how did you overcome the challenge of, uh, for example, infrastructure, lack of infrastructure in case when you don't have infrastructure to respond to the requirements of the EU, uh, of the EU legislation? Uh, how did you overcome that? And uh, for example, the co communal enterprises, which are you know even understaffed or have uh, old uh, equipment, etc., that they cannot respond to the challenges that are set in the directives. And the second question was about the price of services, which you said is three to five euros. Uh, is this uh, is this uh, does this include uh, uh, collection, transport, and disposal? Is it possible to cover the costs with such yeah. small prices? Yeah. Just uh, shortly about the infrastructure, very justified question. And uh, in my slides also, I brought up and emphasized the importance of the waste management planning and uh, namely on the national level. And I think in your case also um, on the, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, Federation subjects level, it is important to do really very detailed base management planning. That is needed uh, in which order actually where the priorities and uh, through this process uh, to give also uh, the costs actually related. And then of course, uh, who could be a possible um, owner of the projects, uh, for example, in the municipal waste, yes, indeed, uh, those could be, or even should be, I think. So basically uh, the <clears throat> municipal structures and now the next question is that how much uh, are the municipalities or those structures itself to finance how much uh, could uh, let's say the state level um, uh, to uh, support and that could be the share of the European Union funds for example. So this is the way how we have done uh, and established the basic infrastructure. And now the next thing is that I would also emphasize is uh, the role of the private um, uh, private companies. Uh, perhaps we are uh, example that uh, uh, from one side it has been very successful because uh, the private companies have a very big role indeed in the especially in the packaging collection and and so on but not only uh, and also even um, let's say municipal waste uh, pretty often it is given uh, to the private companies that they are dealing it and that means that in in such a case not all uh, investments should necessarily be done by uh, public authorities, but something could be easily be left uh, to the if the if there are companies, of course. The, that means that there should be a certain uh, legal environment to allow them to come to the market and to allow and, and so on. Perhaps this, but of course, uh, I also. Uh, consider that in the long run, it could be a very good idea to have at least a basic infrastructure on the municipal waste, uh, on the public hands, uh, uh, to avoid over investments and uh, struggle and, and so on and so on, and control lower also. And that is a good concept, uh, obviously, but that doesn't really necessarily mean that even the collection should necessarily be done by uh, public companies, uh, not to mention uh, recycling. And recycling could be easily and even preferable. Uh, there would be a role of the private companies. Just to add a few, few words, yes, Estonia is a good example. Uh, maybe not to really follow when it comes to too heavy privatization, as, as we several times already said, we uh, municipalities gave away everything. And now, and this is one of the reasons, uh, since there is also competition, why this fee is relatively low when it comes to this type of uh, municipal waste collection. 
But at the moment, this is also one of these obstacles, barriers, why the system is not anymore developing. If the private sector provides you the services, especially under the, uh, under the competition, then they keep the fees low, but they are not really willing to invest into the improvement. And we clearly see in, in Estonia that the private sector has, in a way, stopped the investments. And now, again, municipalities have to come in, especially when it comes to let's say, bio-waste uh, collection and recycling, because this is not uh, economically uh, profitable business. Um, the, the, and there, let's say also there are several other streams like textiles and, uh, and other problematic waste streams that have to be collected now and re recycled. And this clearly, you can clearly see that uh, that private sector is not willing to do big investments anymore into that. So it, there is really a time to take, uh, again, municipalities have to do this themselves and that's why we, we will see that the cost for local residents will will increase uh, at, but uh, but but at the moment i would say yes in estonia this fee is relatively low it is possible to do it if you do it efficiently and then if you want to do it efficiently in a way in a certain amount you have to involve private sector mm -hmm. mm. but perhaps i would uh, add this uh, also that uh, to emphasize the importance uh, um, in a waste management context to find the links to the other sectors. And uh, j just one example, one of many, uh, would be the bio-waste. Uh, and uh, yes, indeed, uh, it should be separately collected, that's for sure. Secondly, now you have two options, whether you compost it or whether you could really uh, produce a biogas out of it. And the biogas production in many countries, I mean, in the Nordic countries, for example, is uh, rather not yet in Estonia exactly that way, but uh, I hope it goes that way. Uh, there are like a big uh, or even medium, perhaps sometimes uh, um, agricultural companies uh, who are really having uh, cows or whatever, actually. Uh, and uh, then uh, they have um, often different problems with the manure. And one of the technical solutions to manage the odor and, and whatever problems uh, related to the, this um, manure is to uh, put it to the biogas. And we have in Estonia some five, six rather big installations uh, really um, producing biogas in that uh, way. And what is not yet uh, in the place is to um, organize the pre-treatment of the source-separated waste and to send this uh, uh, such a pre-treated uh, bio-waste to the biogas. And this is exactly the case that uh, they are doing in Nordic countries and Germany in, in many cases, actually. So, so why I'm emphasizing it is that uh, this is typically not, nothing to do with the municipalities. This is a private uh, companies, and this is uh, clearly also the green energy. Because among of other many, many requirements the EU has, there are also requirements on the energy market. And I don't know really how it looks in Bosnia and Herzegovina right now, but it could be one of the way to develop the biogas production and to this biogas production also to offer part of the solution for the bio waste standing. Thank you very much. Thank you. At the end of our workshop today, may I thank uh, our presenters, speakers, and our participants. At some point, uh, I've seen that uh, we had uh, 140 and something participants. Uh, and Hari, at the end of his presentation, summed up the situation and provided a brief overview. A lot of that can be applied in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And what we've seen today clearly shows that we have to start uh, with a separate collection, with separation at source. Uh, these, we only have some minor pilot project, except for the Canton Sarajevo. In other municipalities, we didn't even have uh, these projects. In order to ensure further development of the system, in addition to landfilling, we need to offer alternative uh, alternatives for waste uh, treatment, waste handling. Uh, and what, what we could see today, one of the ways to improve the system is to include the private sector. I am. regret that I have seen 
that uh, many representatives from the relevant ministries attended this workshop and they are working to introduce certain novelties and improvements, but they do so only through adoption of legislation and don't do much more. But uh, I regret to say that I didn't see uh, any attendance uh, of uh, representatives of the municipalities and companies uh, in the waste uh, management sector. But I do hope that uh, in the process of the ESAP development, uh, we will be able to use uh, these presentations that uh, they will, we, we will be able to benefit from them. And I hope that in future, we will have more members of the working group and that we will be able to apply apply some of uh, your experience uh, you shared with us thank you once again and i thank all the participants uh, for attending this very very useful workshop in my mind may i also thank you all and once again uh, i would also like to invite you to participate uh, in the activities of our working group we have uh, a huge uh, job ahead of us and uh, huge challenges so any help uh, is uh, mostly welcome so we view and consider the waste management from all points of view hope uh, that you'll stay with us until the end of this process to uh, guide us a little bit and uh, provide a very uh, useful uh, insight in uh, what uh, the working groups will uh, prepare and uh, decide on the challenges and uh, and uh, goals for for the for the country thank you very much zahvaljujem se još jednom i do skoro uviđenja hvala još jednom thank you thank you